Um, if you're watching across the country, I hope everybody's doing well. Um, here in our neck of the woods in Hampton Roads, we've had a nice cool uh, spell washed through last night. We've got a lot of rain. Uh, at least a lot of people probably got a, a fair amount of rain, um, which is great for the garden and, and great for the weekend. And it looks like um, the, the weather is going to remain kind of cool. It's a great time to get out in the yard, but also a great time to do houseplants. And so that's what we're going to talk about today is, is houseplants. Um, and we're calling this kind of our houseplant week. We're going to do two webinars on houseplants. This one today will be kind of on the basic, kind of 101 houseplant care. Um, so I want to talk about how to care for houseplants. Um, I'm going to talk about watering, repotting, insect or disease issues that you might have, fertilization, feeding your plants, how to take care of your, your uh, new uh, home, in-home friends. Um, and so that's kind of what we're going to talk about today. And then at the end, I'm going to give you some of my, I'm going to give you my top five uh, easiest indoor plants to grow. So if you're a beginner, um, then, uh, and you haven't done any indoor plants, um, uh, then, then I'm going to talk to you or I'm going to show you my five top favorite, easiest indoor plants to grow. Something that I think, uh, you know, any kind of novice gardener, if you've got a black thumb or a green thumb, you can grow these indoor plants and they're a lot of fun. Um, so we've got a couple questions coming in already. Great, keep on asking questions. I have a house plant that needs some attention, said Gretchen. Um, so we've got a great service here. If you want to bring in your indoor plant, if it's small enough or easy enough for you to bring in, you can definitely bring it in, let us look at it. Um, you can also take pictures, bring it in. That really helps us uh, identify it. And Gretchen, you can also Facebook message us um, if you've got any questions, send some pictures, and we might be able to identify what's happening over, the, over uh, our Facebook uh, uh, instant message. So, um, when, so David said, when should my houseplants come inside? I know some can last up to just before frost. However, others need to come in sooner. I'll talk about that, David, as we uh, talk about uh, some of the houseplant care. So stay tuned. Um, so hopefully uh, everybody's doing well. We're going to go ahead and get started on our houseplant seminar. So like I said, I'm going to do kind of a basic one today, kind of the 101 care. Um, and then Friday, tune in for that one because then we're going to talk about some of the collectible plants. Um, we're going to talk about, you know, specific plants. I'm going to get into a lot of detail on, you know, orchid care or, um, you know, the, the philodendrons are so popular right now and those need specific care. Um, so I'm going to talk about succulents and all that. On Friday, we're going to get into more specifics. Today, I'm going to kind of talk about general all-purpose care. Um, and so that's kind of what we're going to discuss today. Um, and we're going to kind of go through all of that. Um, so plants, uh, indoor plants are super, super popular right now. I think here at McDonald Garden Center, we have probably the biggest collection in Hampton Roads. Um, if you are not in the Hampton Roads area and you're watching from a, a, um, across the country, uh, check out your local garden centers. They have an amazing plant selection typically. Uh, and, and the selection that you're going to get in some of the bigger box stores like Home Depot or Lowe's um, are probably not going to be as good as what you really want. And so finding a local garden center is the best way to do that um, as you start to look into um, your, you know, growing a lot of different plants indoors. Um, this trend has come about as we want to connect with nature and especially with what we're going through with the pandemic. Um, bringing some of that nature in, indoors really helps uh, establish a sense of well-being and, and really kind of makes it a healthy environment. There have been studies done that show that uh, indoor plants in a workspace, so if you've got your office inside your home now, um, will make you actually more productive. Um, so, so, you know, bringing the outside in is a great thing to do. Um, it really, really it just brings you a little bit closer to nature, kind of helps you concentrate on your work, and also just brings a sense of well-being and brings the green indoors. I mean, the colors that you can get from these indoor plants are absolutely amazing. Um, so, so that's kind of why I love indoor plants. I love to grow them, and there's a huge assortment these days. Um, because of this trend and this popularity, um, you know, indoor plants have become more readily available. Now, sometimes some of the more collectible ones, some of the harder to find ones, um, are, are still hard to find uh, because of this, this uh, collector um, um, phase going on or this craze going on of collecting indoor plants. Um, so sometimes it'll take us a little bit of time to get in plants, but we have a huge collection and I, I pretty much guarantee you come in here um, every once or twice uh, or three or four times a month, you're going to see a different plant collection because we are constantly getting in more indoor plants. Every week it seems like uh, we're getting in more. Um, so you're always going to get a great collection here. Um, one, one thing I always, one of the first things that I kind of learned here when, 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 t when dealing with indoor plants is Mother Nature did not create indoor plants. And so that's, I think, kind of a, a good place to start um, is we designed plants or we discovered 
that some of these plants can grow indoors. Um, and a lot of them are going to be tropical plants. So tropical plants, you know, live in the tropics where usually the temperatures are going to remain roughly in that same range. You know, you get closer to the equator, you get into the rainforest, you get into those, those tropical climates, then you're going to get a temperature range of somewhere between obviously 70 and, and 90 degrees. Um, and so you're going to get kind of that consistent temperature. You're not going to get too cold, you're not going to get too warm. Um, so you've got that, that consistency. Um, of temperature, and that's what you get inside your home typically. Um, you know, a lot of us keep our homes anywhere between 68 to 74, 75, somewhere in that range. And so a lot of these plants are going to be tropical plants because they can grow in that year round temperature. They don't need to go dormant like some of our outdoor plants. So if you're planting a tree or shrub, you might be able to grow it inside, but you probably are going to be more successful outside because it needs to go into that dormancy. It needs to go through that cool months, um, to the, the, those winter months to kind of go through that complete life cycle and that complete year cycle of going into a dormancy and coming back out. Now your indoor plants are going to do somewhat of the same and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Um, so where I like to start with, uh, with, with indoor plant growing and we're going to kind of, I'm going to try and run through these basic things fairly quickly and get into a couple specific things. Uh, like I know a lot of people want to know about repotting um, and, and watering is a, is a big topic. So I'm going to kind of roll through these a little bit quick um, as I can and then get in and dive into some specifics as I kind of run across them. Um, the first one is location. Um, so when we're talking about location inside your home, it's all about sunlight. Uh, sunlight, so I, I, there's three things that I think people typically um, have issues with with indoor plants is getting the right sunlight on the plant, watering, and feeding. And so we're gonna talk about those at length. Um, but the first one is obviously location. Know what kind of light you get in your home and in the different rooms in your home. So if you want to plant in your living room, and it gets in your family room or something like that, and it gets, you know, it's got a west facing window. So know that in the west, that's where the sun sets. And so that means it's gonna get a fair amount of light through that window. Know whether you need to put them in the window or in that room with the window. And so again, I'm not gonna get into a lot of specifics. We'll talk about some of those at the end when I talk about my, my five favorites. Um, but um, uh, the, the, the light, component of, of, your, of your indoor plants is very, very important. And a lot of them can range too. So, uh, you know, when you're talking about uh, like a pothos or a snake plant like this guy right here, uh, this a pothos over here, rubber plant, we're gonna talk about a lot of these here in a little bit. Um, you know, the, the lights can kind of range. And so you're gonna hear me say medium to high or medium to low a lot. And so that typically means they can live in kind of a, a range of light. You know, medium to high light, medium to low light. And that's typically how we kind of say that. Um, when you are purchasing a plant, of course, know the light before you come into a garden center. Say, you know, I, I want a floor plant. I want a nice plant in the corner. I want it to be four feet tall. Um, and this is the kind of light that I have in that room. That'll help your local garden center. That'll help us determine the right plant for you. Um, so having that information prepared is, is very, very beneficial to us to make sure that you're successful in your indoor plant. Um, so let's talk about west, east, north, south windows. So east windows are going to be good morning light and then the sun's gonna go over on top of the house um, or into the south um, and then it's gonna go over to the west side of the house. So east windows are gonna get morning sun. Um, and that's not really, really bright sun. It doesn't really get super, super bright until we get to that 10, 11 o'clock time frame. Um, so east windows are going to be kind of in that medium light. Um, I wouldn't call it low light. I'd call it medium light. Uh, west facing is going to be more on the high light because the sun is more intense. It's higher up and you're going to get more light. Now, of course, if you've got trees in the area and they're blocking the light coming through the window, then it's going to be more on the medium side. Now, north facing windows are typically not going to get a lot of sun at all. Now, they're going to allow light into the room, so you're going to get some light into the room, uh, but I would call that a low light situation where if you've only got one window in that room and it's facing north, then that's going to be a very low light situation. And then south would be the highest light. So south would be the best because the sun is going to stay in the south uh, on the south side of the house a majority of the day. Um, and again, if you've got no trees impeding the, the sunlight coming through the windows, then that is going to, um, is going to be a very high light situation. Um, so, so knowing that I think does help kind of understand where the, where the sun is. And then of course, look outside and make sure, you know, you see the light coming in there. Um, if you need a light on in the room to see during the, during the middle part of the day, then that would be a very low light situation. If you don't have your lights on inside during uh, the middle part of the day, then that's going to be a pretty highlight situation, a medium to highlight. Um, so that really helps, I, th I think, understand that. Um, 
there, there are signs that you can see of your plant um, of, of how it's growing if it's not getting enough light. And that's typically going to be uh, a, a stretching. So I always kind of use that term that the plant is going to stretch for the light. So if you're in a low light situation and the plant wants a little bit more light, it's going to start reaching for that light. And typically the plant's going to get thinner and it's going to reach out for the, for the light. Um, now all indoor plants, if you never turn them, so I always recommend turning our indoor plants so they get good light. I mean, this side of this plant is going to get good light. The back side is going to get a little bit more shade. So turning it every so often helps keep that plant growing upright rather than all plants will lean a little bit toward the, towards light. So definitely spin your plants every once in a while. Um, it's a good kind of practice. Every time I water my plant, I'll usually give it a little quarter turn so that, you know, within, you know, a month or two, um, it's getting a full rotation. Um, so I think that really, really helps. Uh, also, uh, you might see a lighter green color. So if you've got a nice dark green leaf, and then all of a sudden over the, the next month or two, it's starting to get a lighter green, it doesn't seem to be as healthy, it might be too, too little light. Uh, too much light is also another issue that, that a lot of us experience with our indoor plants. And typically what you're going to see there is browning on the edges of your plants. So the, the leaves are going to show a little bit of brown, and you might see some brown spots. Uh, and that means that, that that sun is too intense on that leaf and it doesn't want that much light. And so you might need to move it away from the window a little bit or move it into a darker area in your home or something that's got more medium to low light. Um, knowing what types of plants, and there's a lot of research out there that you can do. You can also come in and see us to know exactly uh, what kind of light those individual plants need. But I always tell people, know the light before you come in because that really helps us kind of determine what kind of situation you're working in and what kind of plants you might want to do. Um, and, and if it's not, if you have a desirable plant that you want to grow, then we might be able to help you find the right room for it. So if you've just, you know, I've got to grow succulents, I love succulents, then we'll have, we'll, we'll tell you, you know, you need a very high bright light uh, area uh, in your home to grow those. So think about that. Um, so light is a very important thing and that's location. Um, also think about size. I always kind of bring that up with, with the, the location. Just think about the size of the plant. Uh, indoor plants are not going to grow very aggressively um, because they're not out in mother nature. They're not getting full sun all day. They're not growing in their, their accustomed climate. Um, so they're not going to grow super, super aggressively. Plus they're growing in a pot. So anything that's going to grow in a pot is going to be dwarfed a little bit. So, you know, a ficus tree in the tropics can get huge. Uh, a ficus tree indoors might not ever get bigger than six to eight feet. Um, so knowing those kind of conditions, um, or knowing the size of the plant that you want will also help us determine what type of plant uh, is going to be best for you. The nice thing about indoor plants is because they're grown in pots, you can grow them in indoors for many, many years. Years and years and years. So the, the life expectancy of an indoor plant can be very, very long um, and can grow for a very long time. And then we can talk about even kind of pruning and how to keep plants a little bit shorter if we need to. Um, so do a little bit of research about the plant that you might want. Do a little bit of research in your home about what kind of light you have and the kind of size of the plant that you want. Uh, and bring that into us and we'll help you be very successful with whatever plant you might uh, decide to go with. Um, and so that really does help. Um, I do like to kind of go into like a, what I call an acclimation period after this. So you purchased a plant, you found the plant that you want, it's the right size, it's gonna be the right size, it's gonna last in that area for a while, it's the right light. It's gonna go through an acclimation period and acclimation periods are, are very important. Uh, all of these plants are grown in a greenhouse. Um, a, a lot of them come from Florida um, a, or a greenhouse somewhere. Um, from a growing facility that grows these plants. Um, and so they're used to growing in a greenhouse. Then they come into our greenhouse here. And so they've been in a greenhouse their entire lifespan, basically. And so then you're gonna take them into a home. It's a completely different scenario there. Not saying that, that you can't grow great indoor plants in your home, um, but it's gonna go through a little bit of an acclimation period. And so to go back to that question earlier, uh, you're also gonna experience an acclimation period when you bring your plants indoors from the outside. So if you take your plants outside for a summer vacation, uh, which is a great practice if you wanna do that, you don't have to. Um, a lot of plants I keep inside year round. Sometimes I'll take some out. Um, it just depends on either if the plant, you know, maybe needs a summer vacation um, because it might be struggling a little bit. Um, and so I might need to take it outside, let it get some fresh air, let it get some rainwater, all of those good things. Talk about more of that here in a minute. Um, but, but that might be a reason. But every time you bring a plant from a great growing condition, which would be a greenhouse or the outside area, um, indoors where it's not going to be getting as much light you're going to go through a bit of an acclimation period and what that means is it's going to adjust to its new environment um, so indoor plants are, are are going to go through a bit of an adjustment period and some plants like ficus 
figs um, will drop a lot of their leaves when they bring them in. So a citrus plant is a great one. Um, citrus uh, is very easy to grow in containers. You do have to bring them in. Uh, they make a great indoor plant, but typically when you bring them in or when you purchase one and bring it into your home, you're gonna lose almost all of its leaves and then it rebounds fairly quickly. Uh, and that can happen with a lot of plants. You're gonna go through a little bit of that adjustment period. So just be aware of that. And I just kind of throw that out there as a caution. Don't get overly concerned. Uh, don't throw a bunch of fertilizer in there. Don't throw a ton of water into it. Um, that's not necessarily what it means and needs. So what you wanna do is just kind of stay on the regimen that we're, that we're suggesting that you do um, and, just, and just be patient with it because it is gonna go through that typically. Not all plants do, some plants do very well moving in. And when I talk about my five easiest plants, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna realize that some of these plants won't even, won't even miss a beat really when you bring them indoors. Um, so acclimation is something that I like to throw out there. Um, uh, there. There's a lot of different areas in your home that might have different issues or, or different uh, uh, conditions than it's used to, like a draft. Maybe it's near a heat vent. So those are the things that you're gonna determine. Okay, well, now I've got my heat vent here. I need to move it to an area where it's a little bit further away from that. Um, so that does definitely help. Um, and then of course, humidity. I'm gonna talk about humidity when we get to the watering section, um, but humidity is an important thing. Um, and so if you're growing things in maybe a bathroom or nearby your kitchen sink, where there's a little bit more moisture in the air, um, it's gonna be a bit of a, a better situation than maybe you know in your living room where there's not a lot of humidity. We don't have a lot of humidity in our home, uh, in our homes. And so uh, these plants that grow in the tropics are used to humidity and moisture in the air, and so that's what they like. So that's a perfect segue into my next section, which is watering. And watering is probably the number one issue that we typically run across with indoor plants um, and how to grow them. I know from, for, for a fact that myself, when I first started growing indoor plants, uh, that was my first mistake. As I planted them in a moisture controlled soil, I thought, okay, well, I'll put them in this moisture controlled soil, they'll have lots of water. Um, and then I watered them probably once a week, uh, if not more frequently, and I basically killed all my first group of indoor plants. And I quickly realized that growing them in a greenhouse, which is what I was accustomed to, because that's where I work as a McDonald Garden Center, um, we might water every day, you know, in the summer months, we might water every other day, even in the winter, because we've got a greenhouse, we've got evaporation, we've got sun, we've got wind, we've got different issues that in our home we don't have. And so watering inside your home is gonna be a lot uh, less typically, um, and a little bit more different than you would water outside or in a greenhouse. Um, and so, so do realize that. Um, but I think it's probably the, the number one reason that, that people are not successful with indoor plants, and it's typically overwatering. Um, so all plants have different watering requirements. That's where I usually start. They all have different watering requirements. So, you know, a snake plant compared to a fern, here I've got this gorgeous bird's nest fern, um, are gonna be different watering requirements. Um, and, and every plant has different ones. And I'm not gonna talk too, too much on specifics right now. We'll talk about that later. If you've got questions, ask questions. Um, but watering requirements are gonna be different for every indoor plant. They're all gonna have different watering requirements. And so what I tell people is don't get on a schedule. Don't say, okay, it's you know the middle of the month and that's when I water all my indoor plants. Or every week or every weekend I water all my indoor plants. Because some plants aren't gonna need it, some plants might need it, some plants might need it more frequently. It just depends on the plant. So don't get into a schedule. I think that is, that is certain uh, downfall or, or uh, cause for error if we're watering um, our plants um, all at the same time and we're on a schedule and saying, okay, this is my day to water all my indoor plants and so that's what you do, but sometimes uh, you're gonna have different issues there. So um, what I will say is most plants indoor plants like a wet dry cycle, which is very, very easy. I love wet dry cycle plants because um, it's very easy to determine when they need to be watered again, you let it dry out. So wet dry cycle means you water it really well and then you let it dry out. And in that drying out time frame, then there's not a lot of moisture sitting around the soil. Uh, we don't have a lot of issues and that is what a majority of indoor plants like. And a majority of plants uh, indoors thrive on neglect and that's kind of one of those hard things for us as maybe a new plant parent um, or maybe somebody that's even done this for a long time is, is we tend to baby our plants, we tend to pamper them um, and sometimes they really just kind of want to be left alone and you don't really have to mess with them too much. Um, so that, that is one thing that I will always tell people is a wet dry cycle is very, very easy to do. Um, they thrive on neglect a little bit. So don't pamper your indoor plants too much. 
I'm not going to say don't love them. Love them for sure. And there's a lot of tips and tricks here that I'm going to talk about that will help you uh, love your plants a little bit more. Um, but wet dry cycles are great. Uh, things like ferns and palms um, might need a little bit more of a consistent moisture level. So if your plant says wet dry cycle, easy. Water it when it's dry. Water it really well. Let it really dry out. And that's an easy cycle. And that could be once a month. That could be once every two months. That could be once every two weeks. Depends on how big the plant is, how much potting soil is in there. All lots and lots of different um, variables in this equation. Drafts, sunlight, you know, if you've got an area that, that maybe you have a fan on consistently, it's gonna dry it out a little bit more. So lots and lots of different variables. The best way to test is right here on your hand, your finger. Go down about an inch, which is usually to your first knuckle, and just put it in the soil and just check. If, if the top two to three inches are dry, then it's time to water. So give easy way to, to, to kind of uh, do that. And then what I'll usually do is take them outside and water them really well if it's nice in the summer or in the, in the spring and fall, um, or I'll take them and put them in the bathtub, or I'll take them to the kitchen sink and just water them really well. Very, very easy to do. Um, so let's talk about the type of water. I think a lot of people um, don't, don't realize this, but tap water obviously has things added to it so that it makes it uh, available for us to drink. So for us, it's drinking water, but tap water has fluoride in it. Um, and so that, and that, that fluoride can build up in a plant's root system and cause a lot of issues. And so what I like to do, my easy practice, is I take my watering can, so it's my little simple indoor watering can, and I'll fill this up and I'll let it sit for 24 hours before I water. And then what I really like to do is I'll take this watering can, use it around the house after I've let, and then I'll fill it back up and I'll set it. Because if I use it again two or three days later, because again, I'm not watering on a certain cycle, I'm just watering as the plant needs it, um, then I've always got water that's sat there. And in that 24 hour time span, then a lot of that fluoride gets out of there. So leaving your tap water, sitting in your watering can really, really helps. Of course, rainwater is amazing. So if you can collect rainwater, you will be extremely beneficial. That is what these plants are used to is rainwater. So rainwater is like, uh, is, is like magic to, to indoor plants. Um, so collecting some rainwater is a great way, whether you do it with a bucket or a rain barrel. Um, a lot of us might even be able to just put this at the bottom of our, of our downspout from our house. Um, then it'll just fill up and then you've got rainwater to use. Rainwater is great. I don't think you need to go out and buy distilled water. Um, a lot of people might do that. Um, I don't think that is necessary. I do think that if you just leave tap water sitting for 24 hours, it's, it's going to uh, release a lot of that fluoride and a lot of the different things that we put in our, in our, in our water to make it drinkable and it's going to make it better for the indoor plants. So that is kind of what I do with tap water. Collect rainwater if you can. Rainwater is awesome. If you see a rainstorm coming and you got a plant that maybe is, is, is time for it to water, you might take it outside and just leave it overnight or leave it for one day and let it, the rain kind of, it'll help wash the leaves off. It'll, it'll add a lot of that, that kind of, it got some natural light, got some natural air, and it got um, a, a good amount of rainwater. So if you see a plant that, that's like, oh, I am definitely need to water my indoor plant right now, and you see a rainstorm coming, you might take it outside and water it that way. That really helps. Um, so that's kind of, of, of watering. Let's see. Um, don't let, uh, so yeah, so th then this is another good technique, it, or a lot of, a lot of people uh, have this issue. Let's see if I can find my... Saucers. Saucers are great. They protect your indoor uh, furniture, your floors and stuff like that. It's, that's, that's the purpose of a saucer. The, the purpose of a, uh, the, or the, the not, the, the function, the, the non-function of a, of a saucer is to hold water and allow the root system to suck that up. Now, certain plants that like a lot of moisture, that might be a, 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 an okay thing to do. But let's say I take this pothos here and I set it here and I water my plant. This saucer is just designed to protect my furniture. So what I want to do is after that's drained and it's got its water, then I can take this and go dump it, all, dump it out in the sink and then put it back under. And if it keeps filling up with water, we need to keep on dumping it. That's why I like to really water my plants in the, in the kitchen sink or in the bathtub is they can drain really well and then I can put them back on the saucer. If I start to see water building up in here, I want to take it out and dump it because water will get naturally absorbed into the soil here. And so through these holes in your pot, whether you're growing it in this grower pot or even a decorative pot with a, with a hole in the bottom, um, then that water, if it's just sitting in water, it's like standing in a bathtub for an entire day. You know, you go stand in a bathtub for an entire day, your feet are going to rot off. And that's what no plant likes wet feet necessarily, um, especially indoor plants. And so that is one of the biggest things that I'll tell people is don't let your saucers fill up with water. 
Um, now, let's talk about humidity real quick um, with, with saucers. So what you can do is take a saucer and just some rock, just some gravel. So I've got just this little canister of gravel. I can fill this up with rock and put some water in there just below the rock level. So you got a little bit of, of a water source here and then I can put my plant on top of that. And what that's gonna do is create humidity because as that water naturally evaporates out through the rock and around the plant, it'll create a humid situation right there around the plant. So saucers are very, very beneficial. They can become a humidity tray, um, but they're really designed to protect your furniture. And that's really all it is. Um, some pots, let's see if I've got one here somewhere. I thought I did. Uh, yeah. So some pots like this one have a built in saucer. So that's great. Protects your plants. Very, very easy to do. Um, if this fills up with water, I can just go take it and dump it out and the water will come out. So built in saucers are perfectly fine. That allows you to plant directly in this pot. Um, so some pots have built in saucers, some pots, like this one, don't have a hole at all. There's no hole in the bottom. So this can actually act as your saucer. So I can take, um, let's take that fern, and I can drop this in here, and it can be my saucer. So I've got this great container. Uh, it looks great, it's more of a decorative covering. I'm growing my plant in this grower pot, in this basic plastic pot, and I can just drop it right in there. And then when I water, the water will, get, uh, will stay in here. I can go dump it out and acts as my saucer. So you can plant in these. We'll talk about that in a minute. I'll, give you, I'll go into a little bit more specifics on that when we get into the repotting portion. Uh, but these make great containers, decorative containers. We've got a huge collection of indoor pots, whether they have a hole in the bottom, uh, a built-in saucer, or no hole. Just there, those are the three kinds of types you're gonna run into. So one that doesn't have a hole, I just like to use as a slip-in. Perfect, easy way of creating that saucer. Um, and it's also a decorative container. So that's an awesome way of doing that. Uh, let's see. Um, so humidity is a, is a important thing. Um, I've always been a proponent of, and I guess I've always dealt in the world of outdoor plants um, before I learned too much about indoor plants. And so we always tell people, water the root system, never water the leaves. Water the root system, never water the leaves. Um, and that is a very true statement for our outdoor plants. Our outdoor plants, rainwater is a different scenario. Water, you know, rainwater does not hurt the leaves typically, so don't be too worried about that. Rainwater can splash and spread fungus and disease, and so rainwater can do it, but it's not as frequent as if we're watering. So if we're watering our plants and we're out there spraying the hose over the top of your plants, you can spread fungus, and dampness and darkness cause fungus. I was always taught that, um, and it's instilled in my brain that, that I, I don't want to water the leaves. However, indoor plants are slightly different. They're tropical. They're used to a high humidity level, and they're used to having a little bit of dampness in the air. That humidity will collect on its leaves and the plants are used to it. And so a lot of our indoor plants suffer because there's not enough humidity. So misters are very, very helpful for that. Um, we've got a huge collection of misters in here. They're great for your indoor plants. They're great for if you've got tillandsias, air plants, to water those because they kind of just get the moisture out of the air, um, but also for just misting your plants every once in a while. Um, you can do it up to as much as maybe once a week, um, but just once a month is what I typically do. And I'll just go through and mist my plants um, and it just gives them that little added humidity. Sometimes I might do it right after I water. I'll go through and mist the tops of the plants. It just depends. Um, sometimes I'll do it in between watering. So if I'm not watering, let's say I'm watering once a month, so maybe at the two week period before, so about that middle point before I water again, I'll go through and miss my plants. Just gives them a little bit of humidity, gives them a little bit of moisture. Because after you water a plant, there's moisture in the soil. It's gonna evaporate a little bit, cause a little bit of humidity. Um, but this is a great solution for giving it a little bit of humidity. And so we've always been taught not to water the leaves, this is different. It's a mister, so it's gonna be a very fine mist of water. We don't wanna put a lot on it. We don't wanna mist the plant to the point where the water droplets are collecting into bigger water droplets. We just wanna give it a nice little misting over the top. There's a lot of great decorative misters, functional misters. Um, misters are great. You can also get misters on watering cans. So this is a great little way. It's just got a sprayer on it, but you can also water your plants and then also mist. So, okay, well, I'm going to water my plant, so I'll water this plant. This one I watered a few days ago. Maybe I'll just give it a little mist, give it a little bit of, 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 of humidity. So, misting is actually very, very good for indoor plants. Um, again, know the plant, um, ask us questions. Um, you know, certain plants might not love a lot of misting. Uh, other plants might. 
Um, so, so ask those questions. If you see any kind of issues, then definitely bring those up um, and we'll, we'll definitely help uh, correct those. But humidity is a, gr is a hard thing to accomplish indoors and misting helps. So now back onto the watering thing, a couple quick tips on that. Um, if you are not being very successful with watering, um, you can try a moisture meter. I will tell you moisture meters have been very hard to find recently. Um, and so we're trying very diligently to get more moisture meters in, but moisture meters kind of help take the guesswork out. You, you take the meter, you stick it in the soil, and it'll tell you whether it's wet or dry or in the middle. Um, so it'll be wet, moist, dry. And it's a very, very easy way. A lot of them even have um, um, uh, uh, sunlight meters on them too to tell you if it's, if, if it's getting good light or, or indirect light or low light. So that'll help as well. Um, so moisture meters are great. Um, but, uh, but if you want to take some of the guesswork out of your watering, then watering nannies, what I've always called them, plant nannies, watering maids, whatever you want to call them, um, these are very, very easy to use. It's basically a clay spike. So clay spike here and then your water container. You fill this up with water, you screw on your clay spike, and then you stick this in the plant. Very easy to do, applies water as it needs it. And so the way clay works basically is when it's moist, so when the soil around it is very, very wet, then the pores get tighter and it doesn't allow water out. As that soil dries out on the outside, as the plant uses the moisture, the pores get bigger and it opens up and it allows water to come out. So these are very, very easy to use. There's a lot of different types. So there's that one that's a slightly decorative. This one's kind of like a wine bottle. So it's just got the clay spike and then it comes with this nice bottle. Um, we've got, let's see, I thought I had another one here. Yep, so you can just get just the, the spike and you can put your own wine bottle in it. Uh, so if you're going on vacation or you know you're not gonna be around to water your plant, um, you can put a bigger bottle in here and it will water your plant for a little bit longer. So this is just the clay spike. This is one of my favorites. So this is new, this is, well, it's not new actually, it's been around for a while. They've just been hard to find, but now with this houseplant craze, all these little accessories are coming coming back. So this is a plant saver. Um, it's the exact same idea, it just works on a siphon. So the way this works is, you get your little clay spike here, and then you've got, well, let's see if I can get this off here. You've got this tube which is really kind of cool. So this is going to go into your water reservoir. So you can just get a nice glass bowl. You can get a cup. You can get a lot of different things that you want to use for your, uh, your reservoir. And basically what you're going to do is soak this entire thing. So you're going to take this cap off and take this off and drop this in water and soak it for, I think it's something like uh, 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 30 minutes, maybe an hour or two. Um, soak this in water. And then basically what you're going to do is fill it up with water, put the cap on, drop this into your reservoir, and put this in your plant. And typically you want your reservoir a little bit lower, same height is fine. If you do it higher, so if you do your water reservoir higher, it's gonna consistently kind of pull water in. If you do it uh, at the same level or lower, uh, then it's going to siphon it in as it dries out. So basically what's gonna happen again, is as your soil dries out, it's gonna, the pores are gonna open, the water is gonna come out. As that water comes out from this reservoir in here, it's gonna siphon more in from your larger reservoir. So if you are like, if you've got a beach house or you know, you've got a, 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 an office or something that you're just not watering much, or if you just wanna take the guesswork out, then this is an easy way of doing this. You can get a large glass bowl that looks kind of pretty. I think it's kind of cool looking to kind of show it off. Look at what I've got. I've got this cool contraption. Then you just drop this into the water. It's a little bit of a weighted kind of uh, filter end. You just drop that down, put this in your plant, and you're ready to roll. And you don't have to water again until you see that bowl getting low. Um, so very, very easy way of doing that. That's uh, the blue mat is what they call them. Um, but this is a plant saver spike. And so what's cool about that is you don't have just this smaller container. You can go bigger if you need to. So I really love watering spikes. They take kind of the guesswork out of it. So if you've had some, some issues with watering and, and maybe you want to take some of the guesswork out, then you might try some of these plant saver spikes. I think they're really cool and something that is now available because of the plant trend and the indoor plant trend kind of coming around. And so now all these kind of cool things are coming back and, and we can get them for you. So plant saver spikes are really cool. Uh, plant nannies, watering aids are, are awesome. Uh, moisture meters, watering is super important. So I don't want to go too much longer into it, but watering is very important. Knowing the, the watering requirements of your plant, wet dry cycle, easy to follow along with. I like, love plants that have wet dry cycle. Uh, now, if you're a little bit more of a heavy water and you just like to water your indoor plants, then let us know that. You might be better off with a fern 
ferns love a little bit more moisture. We can find you plants that can take a little bit more moisture. Just tell us, say, hey, look, I've got kind of a heavy hand at watering. I tend to pamper my plants. I want to water them a fairly uh, a good amount. We'll find you plants that can take a little bit more moisture. Um, so, so kind of knowing your own thing. Um, but what I usually tell people is don't baby your plants too much. They typically thrive on a little bit of neglect. Okay, so now let's talk about feeding your plants. You've had your plants for a while. You're being very successful. You got them in the right condition. We've got them in the right location. We know the size of the plants right. Um, I, I'm watering correctly. So now let's talk about feeding plants. There's lots and lots of different ways to do it. Um, and there's no one right way or wrong way, really. Um, what I typically love to do is use our, our good old favorite, our green leaf fertilizer. So we've got these in two different formulas. So we've got our traditional green leaf and we've got our organic green leaf. So our organic green leaf, um, I typically um, will tell people if you've got indoor pets, um, organic fertilizers, organic plant foods, typically are gonna come from chicken or turkey. This one comes from turkey. Um, so it, it, it comes from that. And so, so if you've got dogs or cats, they might tend to dig around in it a little bit much if they tend to be interested in your plants. Um, so you might try a traditional formula because they're not going to be enticed to mess with it as much, or you might go with a liquid. And so liquids are also good, but I love our traditional green leaf fertilizer. It's a 1248. So it's got a good kind of well balanced. That's typically what you want is a three, one, two ratio. So if you think about a three, one, two, then this would be, uh, that, that ratio a 12, four, eight. And our organic is very, very similar. This is an eight, two, four. So very, very similar kind of ratio. And that's kind of a great well balance. What I love about our fertilizers, our plant foods, is they have micronutrients in them. So when you get a, a, a normal fertilizer, um, a basic fertilizer, then you're only gonna get your nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Those are your three big numbers, your macronutrients. Your micronutrients are things like boron and copper and zinc and iron and all those different things. And those are super, super important. And so if you're, if you're just giving them a basic fertilizer all the time, basic plant food, you're always gonna be kind of lacking those micronutrients. So check your labels and, and make sure that it's got some of those other smaller things. It's not gonna be a huge percentage. So copper is 0 0.05. So it's not a very high percentage of, of copper, but just that little bit, that small trace element, that micronutrient is very important to a lot of different plants. And so that's why I love this plant food. Now there's a lot of one, other ones out there and we carry a lot of, uh, of assortments because certain people like different ones. Osmocote is not a bad one. Osmocote is a six month feed. The downfall of that is typically if it's a six month feed, it's going to take a long time to release all that fertilizer. So it's going to be very slow release and very slow release fertilizers. Plant foods are going to, are not going to give it a, a boost. So if you're looking for a little bit of a boost, if you need some, to brighten it up, if you know, maybe I've missed it. I forgot to do it, you know, two months ago, then, um, then this one's not going to give you that boost. It's going to be a slow, Feed. So this might be something you might want to mix into your soil when repotting or something, but Osmocote's an okay one. I still prefer our green leaf. Um, and then of course there's liquid foods. Um, so of course, you know, you got just your basic miracle Grow. You can just pump this into your watering can or pump it onto your plant and then water it in. But uh, liquids, there's a lot, a lot of liquids out there. Let's see if I've got another one. Uh, yep. So this one is, is your basic 20, 20, 20. This is one of my favorites. It's a water soluble. So I'll mix this into my watering can. So usually I like to, to do a liquid feed um, about every two or three waterings. So I'll usually just kind of on my calendar, on my plant calendar, I'll just write down, this is what I fed. And then I'll usually wait a couple weeks and, and, or a couple waterings and then feed again then. And you just mix this water, right into your watering can. It's super, super easy to use. It's water soluble. And it's a 20, 20, 20, just basic across the board, gives it some nutrients real quick. It's water soluble, which means it's gonna be in the water. It's gonna go right into the root system. So it gives it a nice little boost. Um, really, really good. Um, also, one of my other favorites is Super Thrive. So Super Thrive um, is actually not a fertilizer, but it's, um, it's a kind of a, a, what I kind of call is like a steroids for plants. It takes the shock off of plants. So if you've got indoor plants that are kind of struggling a little bit, you might try Super Thrive. A lot of times people will say, I don't know what's going on. It's not an insect. It's not a disease. It just seems to be struggling. Um, you know, maybe it's repotting. It could be a lot of different things, but if we're not quite sure, then Super Thrive is what I'm always going to kind of recommend because Super Thrive just kind of takes the shock of a plant gets it rejuvenated and kind of gets it going again. It's a vitamin supplement. It is not a plant food, so you can't just use this, but Super Thrive is a great one. And this one's actually comes in a foliar spray. So we've got it where you can mix it with water and water the plant. This is a foliar spray, which is awesome. This is actually a new product this year. Um, so you can spray the leaves of your plants, 
give it kind of that humidity, but also give it some plant food directly into its leaves. Um, and, and so it, it's that vitamin supplement. It's, it's awesome. It just helps um, all stages of plant growth and just kind of takes the shock off of the plant and gets it rejuvenated again. So sometimes if you're just like, I'm clueless, I've tried everything, I've moved my plants around, um, I, I'm, I know I'm watering correctly, I know I'm doing everything correctly, it just seems to not be doing very well, try some Super Thrive. It's something that I definitely recommend having around. It also comes in a little concentrate bottle that you can mix in with your watering can. It's awesome. It's not the end all be all, so it's not, you can't just use this. Um, I recommend it a lot for bonsais because bonsais are kind of stressed out plants. And bonsais are, are, the root system is contained and it could be a bigger plant and a very small root system. And so bonsais do great with Super Thrive. It really does help them. So just another kind of thing that I'll throw out there that I love Super Thrive. It just kind of takes the shock off of, of the plant um, if it's going through that. Um, with plant feeding, I like to talk about dusting our plants too. So it kind of sounds funny, but, but plants uh, breathe through their leaves. That's how they breathe. And so imagine having, I mean, we're all used to it now wearing a mask, um, but imagine you know, having a layer of dust over top of your leaves it's, it's going to struggle to breathe. So cleaning off your plants is very, very beneficial. So this is where kind of the shower method comes in. I really like doing that. If my plants seem a little bit dusty and I, and I, need, and I feel like I need to clean them, and maybe it's got something like, you know, let me grab this fern here. So like this fern is a great example. Or I've got this little pencil cactus here that I love, one of my favorite plants. Um, and so harder to kind of wipe these leaves off. If it were this snake plant over here on my left, over my shoulder here, that's pretty easy. I can take a damp cloth and wash that off pretty easily. Um, but something like this is going to be harder to do. Um, even the fern with as many leaves as we have in here would be, might be harder to, to do. So take it into the shower. Again, rainwater would be great. So if you see a storm coming and the temperatures are okay, then take, uh, take them outside, let the rainwater hit them. Uh, it'll wash them off and they'll love it. Uh, but showers work as well. Um, just be careful not to, to hit them too hard and splash your potting soil all over the place and make a mess. Um, a lot of us have sinks with the little uh, shower on top. You can do that. You can kind of turn it to the side so it's not splashing your soil all over the place and making a mess. Rainwater is a great choice, but washing off your leaves really does help. Uh, the mister will help as well. So you can take a mister and mist your plant down and take a damp cloth and just kind of wipe it off. Wipe some of those leaves off. It really helps kind of keep some of that dust off. Um, and last but not least, if you need to, leaf shine really does help kind of clean your plants. Um, so leaf shine is, is in an aerosol spray. You want to make sure to read the directions, make sure you stand far, far enough away back. And if you're concerned about a specific plant, I would probably wouldn't leaf shine my snake plant, um, but something like a aglaonemia, which is what this one is, this would be easy to, to kind of just spray some leaf shine. You want to typically be about 12 to 18 inches away. So you want to get a fair amount of di distance. But what this aerosol is going to do is hit the plant. It's going to push that dust off and then it's going to lay a nice kind of thin layer of this shine on it. So I love to use this like if I've got company coming over, if I've got friends or family coming over and I want to kind of spruce up my plants and make them look bright and shiny, then I love to use leaf shine. Um, this plant right here to, to, to this side of me is called a rubber plant. I'm going to talk about this one in a minute. Um, but you can kind of see that really, really nice sheen on those leaves. Now that's natural for this plant, but if you want that on some of your other plants, leaf shine is a great option. So in fact, let me just show you what it looks like. So we've got this, uh, we've got this aglaonemia. This one is called, let's get the name right, Maria. Love that kind of, that different variegation there. Really cool. So I'm going to just kind of keep it about this far away. Just kind of turn a little bit to me. And I'm just going to lightly spray it down about 12 to 18 inches away. Look at that. Look at that shine that it just gives it. So it's just really, really pretty how it can really just brighten up your plant. Super, super simple. You might do it outside. It does have a little bit of a fragrance to it. Not like hairspray, but kind of similar, but really nice kind of leaf shine to it. Uh, really brightens up your plant, cleans it off a little bit. So great option there for you is leaf shine. All right. So we've talked about location, sunlight. We've talked about a little bit of that acclimation period. We talked a lot about watering. We talked about the feeding, all the different types of plant foods. So now let's talk about repotting. We've had our plants now for a year maybe. And that's typically when that time frame comes where you might want to repot it. Um, so we've had the plant for a while. So why would we repot a plant? Well, there's not a lot of soil in it. So let's say you're watering it. All of a sudden, I went from watering it once a month to now I'm watering it every week. It seems like I water it and the next, you know, in four or five days, it's wilting again. 
It might be because there's not a lot of potting soil in there. Um, it also, you might see a lot of yellowing leaves. You might see issues there uh, of yellowing leaves um, or, or different types of issues. Um, typically, the best way to tell is by the root system. Okay, I've got a really, really strong root system in here. I, don't, I can feel like I don't have a lot of soil. I don't know if I grabbed a plant that is really, well, you can always do that with a snake plant. So if you squeeze your pot, your plastic grower pot, or if you take it out and you can see, let's see if I can do this here without making a gigantic mess. So you can see, okay, I've still got a lot of soil on that. So that is actually perfectly fine to keep growing in this for a while even though it felt kind of tight now that I've looked at it. And that's a great way of determining if your plant needs to be repotted is by checking the root system. I didn't see a lot of roots. I still see a lot of potting soil. I think that's fine. This can last in here for probably another year. Um, but if you take your root ball out and you see a massive root system, you don't see a lot of potting soil anymore, then it's time to repot it. Uh, this is the most important thing about repotting is um, don't go into a big, huge pot. So don't take this six inch snake plant and go into a 10 or 12 inch pot. Cause now what happens is, and I did this too. I mean, everybody does this, I think says, I want this plant to be like this. I want to take this plant and grow it into this size plant. The problem is it takes a little bit of time. And so a lot of us will take a small plant. Uh, even a better example would be like this little four inch spider plant. So we've got this little plant here. I want it to be huge. So I want to plant it in into a big pot and I want to get it nice and big. The problem is, is indoors, we don't have wind, we don't have evaporation isn't as high, we don't have a lot of sunlight. So typically what's gonna happen is when you put this in a big pot with a lot of soil around it, that soil has no root system. That soil, when you water it, is gonna stay moist for an extremely long period. So when I, remember I mentioned about the saucer holding water? Soil can hold water too, and if we've got too much soil, it's just as bad as letting your plant sit in a saucer full of water, full of water. So, so taking that, 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 that idea and saying, if I've got all this soil around there, then that root system can't use it. It's just like the roots are going to sit in water. And so that's typically what, what we, what we want to avoid. And so what I want to recommend is just gradually staging up. So take this and go into, so a four inch, I might go into a six inch a six inch into an eight inch, an eight inch into a 10 inch and so on. So typically you only want to go one to two or three inches up. You don't want to go too, too big, too fast. Um, it's not going to work that way, um, especially if you're growing it indoors. Now, if you're going to plan on taking it out for a summer vacation, you might be able to get a little bit more rapid development of root growth to a, a, accompany all of that soil. Um, it's going to dry out faster for sure. So if you're taking a plant, let's say I want to put this in an eight inch pot. I love this pot. I've got this great eight inch pot. I've got to plant it in there. Um, this is what I've got to do. Then what I would do is wait until next spring. Once the temperatures are above 50 consistently a night, I will take this, plant it in that eight inch pot and leave it outside and give it, and, I, and we'll talk about kind of acclimating it to the outdoors and indoors here in a minute. Um, but then what will happen is through that time frame of, of leaving it out there all summer long, um, then it um, can absorb that moisture. It can use that moisture in the root system. It's got evaporation. It's got wind and different things to help take the moisture level down in that potting soil. And then this plant can grow into that eight inch pot. And by the time the summer's over and we come into fall, I can bring it back indoors. And now I've upgraded my pot a little bit faster. But if you're growing it inside, gradually stage up. Indoor plants love to be root bound consistently. So we don't want a lot of moisture. We don't want, and especially going into the winter months. So if you're thinking about repotting now, you might say, hey, can it make it till spring? Because we're not gonna water as much in the winter. Plants aren't gonna grow as quickly. I know it sounds like you know, we keep our, our temperature pretty consistent inside, but still during those winter months, we're not gonna get as much, as much growth. We've got uh, you know, cooler temperatures at night. Our house stays typically a little bit cooler, so um, it's not gonna grow as much. Um, and the sun is not as high either. And so as the sun is not as intense, we're further away from the sun. So obviously um, we're not gonna get as much, as much sunlight. It's not gonna grow as, as, as quickly. So the root system is not gonna need as much moisture. So think about those things, all of those kind of things, just kind of put yourself in, in the plant's shoes and kind of think about how the plant might be thinking. And if you can stage it off, if you're like, ah, I think I can make it another two or three months, then I would say make it through winter. Um, get through winter and then replant it in the spring when you know it's gonna actively grow a little bit faster, the root system's gonna grow a little bit more, um, and it's gonna be able to, to accompany a little bit more extra moisture with that soil. So that's kind of what I recommend with repotting. This was a great example, see? See those roots coming out of the bottom? So this one might actually be able to take another 
pot size up. I'm not going to take it out because I don't want to rip those roots. But as I feel around, it feels like it's got some good soil in there. I think I'm okay. So just kind of, you know, take, take some of the guesswork out and just kind of, you can push it a little bit. You can neglect your indoor plants a little bit more than you probably think. Um, so, but, but watch the signs. So if you see your plant wilting consistently, peace lilies are a great one for that. Peace lilies tend to wilt pretty quickly in a day or two. Um, you can see a peace lily wilt fairly quickly. Um, and so those, you know, you might want to look at, do I need to repot this? Um, and a great way of doing it is just to repot it into another grower pot, into another black, you know, you know traditional growing pot. Um, I like to keep a lot of those little pots as I have them. Um, so I can kind of stage up my plants in those and just slip them into a decorative container. Um, so it's a great way of kind of gradually staging up. If you want to plant it right into a direct container, uh, let's talk about that for a quick second. Um, one thing is the potting soil. Make sure you always use potting soil. Never use a compost, never use a topsoil, never use a planting mix. Planting mixes are designed for outside. Always use a professional potting soil. McDonald all-purpose potting soil is the best. Um, I love it for indoor plants. Um, our natural and organic potting soil is good. Uh, natural and organic potting soil has a uh, aloe wetting agent, which typically holds a little bit more moisture. So it's a little bit of a thicker kind of mix. I typically find experience. So I like my indoor plants to be able to dry out a little bit quicker in case I overwater or something. Um, I know I'm not gonna to, to create any issues. So that all-purpose potting soil um, has, a, has a, a traditional wetting agent in it, which helps it dry out a little bit faster, and which is why I love it. We also carry a lot of assortments of small bags, of cactus mix, of, um, of, of seed starter, of peat moss, of vermiculite, so you can mix your own mixes, perlite, you've got a lot of these small bag components, uh, black gold, espoma, we've got a huge collection of small bags of potting soil. So if you want to get real specific, African violet potting soil, cactus and succulent mix, um, indoor growing soils. So we've got a lot of different small bags of potting soil as well. So we've got something for everybody. Um, but let's talk about repotting into a pot that um, has no holes or has a hole or has a saucer built into it. So if you've got this, this is a great example. This one's kind of cool because it's got this little plug down here. So I can take this plug out and now it's got a drain hole. Um, I typically am always going to recommend if you're planting into a decorative planter to get one with a drain hole um, because I think it really helps taking a lot uh, of guesswork out of, of watering. Um, so you know that you're going to get good drainage. Some people might put a little coffee filter, a little piece of weed fabric or something over the hole, fill it with potting soil, maybe a little bit of rock down the bottom so that that drainage hole doesn't get clogged. But typically when you water your indoor plants, you're going to know if that plant's draining well. And having a drain hole really helps. If you're not going to have a drainage hole, so let's see if I've got that other pot. Um, where'd it go? I lost my pot. Uh, oh, yeah, it's on my fern. So like that really cool silver pot doesn't have a drainage hole. If I've got to plant it in here, like I, this is my favorite pot, I've, I've got to have this, I've got to plant it in here, you can still do it. Talk to us, um, let us know what you're doing and we'll help you get it right. But the most important thing about using a container that doesn't have a drainage hole in the bottom, has no hole in the bottom, uh, I love to use these as saucer and decorative covers, but if you're gonna plant in here, you wanna use charcoal. So charcoal is very, very important. Now, some people say you can put the charcoal in first and then a layer of rock and then the potting soil, or it might be vice versa. Either way, it doesn't really matter. I typically tend to, to go with put a layer of rock. So I'll just get my decorative rock here or just pea gravel or something like that. Wash it off real well. Put a layer of that in the bottom, about a half an inch to an inch deep, um, and then put a layer of charcoal over the top. And what that does is it creates a reservoir. So down here in the bottom, the water is going to go down here, collect, as it gets absorbed back into the soil and into the root system, it's gonna go through that layer of charcoal. So I wanna put about a half an inch, an inch layer of charcoal over top of that rock. As that water goes through the charcoal, it'll take any kind of uh, issues that it has. Because if you've ever grown in a container with no holes and it's just soil, then it's gonna get kind of boggy. It's gonna smell, it's gonna get this kind of nasty, gross smell to it. Uh, think of a swamp. It's gonna have that kind of smell and most plants don't want that. Um, and so that charcoal and that layer down that, that reservoir is gonna keep it clean. And then as that, mo as that water comes, so it's gonna get filtered as it goes through the charcoal, it's gonna get filtered when it gets absorbed back through. Um, really helps. I also like doing the layer of rock in the bottom because if I'm like, oh man, I think I've overwatered this thing. It just doesn't seem to be drying out. I can put my hand over the soil and kind of turn it to the side. Maybe I'll take a, 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 a skewer or something and kind of poke a hole, maybe a straw um, sometimes and just poke a little bit of a hole, turn my pot to the side 
and pour it out without letting all that soil come out and without disturbing too much of the layers or the root system. And that water can still get through because I did that layer of rock down in the bottom. So do a layer of rock, charcoal, and then your soil and plant around that. And that will filter the water as it comes back through um, and help kind of take, kind of not disinfect, but charcoal is used to make, you know, turn bad water into to better water uh, by filtering it. Um, so think of like your Brita water filter. That's what's in there is charcoal. Uh, basically, it's you're going to take the the the, the um, small things and, and the and the funk. What I usually say, the funk out of the out of the the, the water. Um, so charcoal is very important if you're going to plant something without a hole. So like terrariums is a great example of that. Terrariums, a lot of us want to grow a terrarium, and they're awesome. You know, a glass bowl where you can see all those layers. Charcoal is a must. Anytime you plant anything without a hole in the in drainage hole, you got to be more careful about your watering. But you got to use charcoal. Super super important point. Um, so let's move on. So that's kind of um, so that's kind of what I want to talk about with, with repotting. Uh, let's talk about insect and disease issues. Broad kind of, uh, of subject here. Uh, our insect and disease issues can occur. They're pretty easy to take care of with indoor plants uh, because we're watching them a little bit more. Uh, 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 we're, we're really kind of uh, keeping an eye on them more. Uh, you're typically going to recognize them more. Now, if you've got a plant area where you've got a lot of plants, if you find a disease or insect issue on one of your plants, then get it out of there. Take it to an area that you can quarantine it because I think that's important. Get it away from the other plants before it starts to spread. So if you recognize it early enough, get it away um, and then quarantine it. You can also cut off a leaf and bring it in. Let us look at it um, and that will really help kind of identify what the issue is. Um, you might think it's a fungus, but it might just be too high light. It might be too much water, too little water. Lots and lots of different variables there. Um, there's a couple different solutions that you can use. Um, I typically start with, so if you've got like spider mites, you got a little black spot fungus, you got a little bit of an issue here, I always recommend having a bottle of triple action around. So this is Fertilome's triple action. It's awesome. It contains neem oil and um, pyrethrin, and pyrethrin comes from chrysanthemums. So this is an organic, easy to use solution. Um, it's an insecticide, fungicide, and miocide. Now the downfall of any of those things is insecticides, fungicides, miocides, is they do so much that it might take multiple treatments to cure it. But having a bottle of triple action around is a great, great thing to do. Um, because it's super easy to use, it typically isn't gonna hurt any plants. Always test an area, that is another great tip, is just spray it on this leaf right here. Um, see how it does over the next 24 to 48 hours. And if you don't see any effects, then you can use it on every plant. Most plants you're not gonna have an issue with, um, but some succulents and um, uh, orchids, some of those other temperamental African violets, temperamental plants, um, that, that have you know, different foliage, or you maybe even have a, a succulent feel, moisture in there, furry you know, leaves, like you think of an African violet has the little furriness to it. Um, some of those leaves are a little bit more sensitive to different types of spray, so just be careful and test a small area. But triple action is pretty safe. Uh, pyrethrin is going to be a little bit of a stronger insecticide, and then the neem oil coats and suffocates. So triple action is a good one to have around, especially if you don't know what it is and you don't have a chance to bring it in. You're pretty safe to go ahead and spray triple action on it because it'll probably help uh, stop the spread and hopefully eventually cure the, the issue. So I definitely recommend having a bottle of triple action around. I love this indoor outdoor insect spray. So uh, again, made by Fertilome. It's called indoor outdoor uh, multi-purpose insect spray. The reason I like it is because it's an aerosol. So aerosols again are fine misty sprays. They get into all the nooks and crannies. Um, and so I really love this spray because it's that aerosol it kind of gets in there, gets into the cracks. So if you've got mealybug or spider mites or any kind of those different issues, uh, aphids, you know, that, that can get down into the, those, those nooks and crannies in your plant, then this one kind of helps really get down in there. So I like, I like this one too. Um, and this one's permethrin. So this is a traditional method, but it's a very effective one too. Um, if we want to go organic, my two favorite organic solutions are neem oil. I think we all know neem oil. Neem oil has been a little bit hard to find if you're looking for it out there. Uh, we've got a great supply of it, so we've got plenty of it. This is made by Natural Guard. It's completely organic. Um, so neem oil is a great one. It works by suffocation. So it's going to, you want to spray it over the entire plant. Make sure it's kind of coated. Um, you don't want to spray it to the point where it's dripping, but pretty close. Um, so that you're coating the plant and it works by suffocating the insect or fungus out. So if it's a fungus or disease issue or an insect issue, neem oil could work. This is kind of that all-purpose Triple action has neem oil in it. It's also got pyrethrin, but neem oil just by itself is a good one. It's a very safe one too. Uh, the most important thing to do with this is if you've got it in a very, very bright sunny window, don't spray the plant and put it right back in the sunny window. 
take it and move it to a little bit of a shady location until it dries because this can intensify the light coming in through your window. So think about that with neem oil. Um, and then the last one is another one of my favorites. This is Spinosad soap, Spinosad, Spinosad um, soap. So what this is is an insecticidal soap with Spinosad. Spinosad is an organic insecticide. So this is specifically an insecticide, which is why I love it because it just attacks in insects. Um, and so it works great on any of those smaller ones, white flies, aphids, mealybugs, all those different ones. This is a great one. And all of these come in ready to use, which I love because you don't have to think about anything. You don't have to mix it. You're probably not going to go through much of it because you're just going to spray here and there as you see issues. Um, so this is a great one. Um, also, when you bring your plant in from outdoors, from an indoor, so I'm going to kind of get to that part now, um, is, is think about, you know, if, if you've had your plant outside for an entire summer time frame and you're bringing it back in, and so one of the questions earlier was, when do I need to bring them back in? Well, watch your nighttime temperatures. Um, I would typically say, just to be on the safe side, is if your plant, if, if the temperatures get below 55, then bring it back in. That, that's a good time to start acclimating it back in. I might bring it in for a couple nights and then take it back out and bring it back in. And again, kind of letting it kind of acclimate, okay, this is my new home I'm coming back into. It's the same thing if we're going out. So if we're going out in the springtime or in the early summertime and we're taking our plants out, then we want to acclimate it to the light. It's been growing inside a home for an entire season and so for, through the entire winter and then taking it out and putting it in full sun, which I probably wouldn't recommend full sun for any indoor plant typically. Um, you're typically gonna wanna just put it in a shady condition, something that maybe gets morning light, afternoon shade, underneath trees, on a deck, porch, or patio works great. Um, and that way you just don't wanna, so if you've got a plant that you might wanna work out into more sunlight, gradually work it out into that condition. Same thing about coming back in. Now, temperature is important, so making sure that we never take our plants out and let them get below 50 is really kind of the recommended level. I like to say 55. Now, yes, there's specific ones like 60, and really you can bring it back anytime you want. So I, I think the, I think the uh, um, person's name that asked the question was David. And David, so if, um, and so, you know, the temperature last night in this area at least got down to almost 61. I might think about starting to move those plants back in pretty soon. Um, because those cooler nighttime temperatures are not, it's not gonna, it's not gonna want to grow in that. And you're bringing it back into a home that is typically gonna be kept around the 70s, which is what it's probably been used to now. So it's a pretty good time to say, okay, it's coming back in, it's not gonna go through a major shift. I don't wanna like let it get too low and then bring it back in where it's gonna get back up again. It's, it's gonna be confused. It knows that it's going into a, a time of the year where it's cooler out. So go ahead and bring those back in. It's not too early, um, it's not too late. So we don't have to worry about any of those issues. Better safe than sorry. A typical rule of thumb I like to use is 55 degrees. When I start to see the nighttime temperatures get to 55, then I bring it back in and that's it and I'm done. And I kind of do it over a week time, a week, week long period where I'll just bring them in for a couple uh, uh, nights to get them through that, that, um, that, that cool nighttime temperature. I'll take them out during the day, bring them back in at night, and then I kind of start to bring them in and leave them in for maybe an entire day, and then take them out for a little vacation for a day, and then bring them back in. So I hope that helps. Just kind of work with them and kind of acclimate them a little bit. It's just for a week, doesn't take too long. Um, help them out a little bit, um, and, and that, that's a good one. I see somebody ask about gnats. Gnats are an issue, and so kind of where I'm going to with, with bringing it back inside, after its summer vacation is a lot of animals or animals, insects will make home in your soil of your outdoor plants. So I've got, let's say I grew this pothos out on my front porch all summer long. Maybe fungus gnats have laid some eggs in here. Maybe uh, some aphids or mealybugs have, have laid some eggs in here. When you bring them back inside, um, they're laying their eggs because the nighttime temperatures are getting cool and it's saying, I'm going, it's going, it's getting winter. I'm going to lay my eggs. I'm going to let them sit dormant through the winter and then they'll hatch and, and they'll come back. But then you bring it inside, the temperature comes back up. It's 70 degrees consistently. The eggs hatch and you have an insect issue. So there's a couple different things you could do. You can spray the soil before you bring it in. Um, I love this. Um, this indoor outdoor. So if I've got a good strong root system, I'm not going to spill a lot of soil. I might pull this out, kind of spray it around the root system real quick. I might spray it in through the holes in the bottom on the top surface. It's just a great one because like I said, it gets into all those nooks and crannies. So I really like this one. Um, malathion is another good one. Malathion is a little bit stronger, but you can mix it as a drench and just water your plants a couple days before you bring them inside. That'll kill all the larva stage and insect and egg stage of, of, a plant, of an insect uh, that you might have. And then of course, just watch it when you bring it back in. Make sure you're kind of keeping an eye on it for a couple days. I don't need you to excessively water it or do any of those things. I just want you to kind of inspect it every once in a while 
and look for any kind of insect issues that you might have. That's typically where it comes from. Not saying it can't come from a greenhouse or come from anywhere. It could come off your clothing that you bring insects into your house and you just don't realize it and they find a host and now they can live on the plant. So they can come in your house a lot of different ways. A lot of people that grow plants exclusively indoors year round still get insect issues. It's natural, it happens. They come in, if you've got pets, they come in on your pets, they come in on your clothing, on your shoes. Um, they can get in a lot of different ways and then they make home and then they can start to reproduce and, and grow fairly quickly. Um, so that's where insects can come from. Um, fungus gnats are a problem. Um, I did bring um, one thing, which is sand. I like to top dress some of my plants with sand, especially ones that I might have fungus gnat issues with um, because they won't go and burrow down and lay their eggs in them. So if I've got a lot of plants like in my kitchen area um, where sometimes you'll get fruit flies and fungus gnats and those types of things, then putting a layer of sand over the top of the root system really does help. Um, so that's a great option for you. Um, and um, I don't have them right now. Again, some things are hard to find right now. Uh, but we also have these little sticky traps that work great. So it comes on a stick. You take a stick, you take a little skewer, you put it down your plant. It's a little yellow piece of uh, folding paper that you fold over top of it and it's got some stickiness to it. You can put that into your plant. The fungus gnats get attracted to it. They get all stuck on there. And then you can discard the, the, the sticky trap a little bit later. Remember like those old fashioned fly traps that we used to hang from the ceiling? It's kind of similar to that, but it's just on a nice little yellow piece of paper. It attracts the gnats. Um, they, they work on white flies. They work on aphids. They work on a lot of different insects. Um, and you can just put that in there. Um, I think I might have still some in the store. I didn't see any, um, but I will have more uh, for sure as we tend to try and find all these things out there that uh, have gone missing because uh, plant um, uh, business has been kind of crazy and we've had a lot of, 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 of new customers and that's been great, uh, but we're trying to find those things out there. So hopefully that helps. Uh, those are a great uh, option as well. Um, and of course, this aerosol spray, I kind of keep going back to it. It works great on fungus gnats. You see them flying around the plant, spray it over top of the plant. It settles, it gets onto those fungus gnats and it kills them pretty quickly. So this is a great one. I use this on just like house flies and anything around the home. Uh, it's a really, really good one. Ants, cockroaches, spiders, aphids, mealybug, works on all of them. So it's a really, really good one. Um, so that's kind of the insect and disease portion. If you want to get specific on diseases, you might use like a copper soap is a great uh, um, uh, organic. Uh, option if you've got a fungus occurring that we need to take care of. You might also be able to use a garden fungicide, a traditional garden fungicide. And the one other thing that I forgot to bring in, which I love too, is systemic insect granulars. So it's a granular, just like a fertilizer, you sprinkle it over the top of the soil, it goes into the system of the plant, protects it for up to four to six weeks, maybe even eight weeks. Uh, depending on the, the size of the plant and how quickly it's growing. So there's lots and lots of solutions for any kind of insect or disease issues you have. Um, keep your plants clean, that type of thing, and inspect them every once in a while. So hopefully that helps with that. All right, so that's kind of my general 101. Let's run through it real quick again so we can kind of touch basis on them. Location, think about your sunlight, think about the size of the plant. Acclimation period, don't get concerned if you bring your plant home and within a week or two, it's starting to kind of look like it's struggling. It's going through an acclimation period. Be prepared for that. Uh, watering, we talked a lot about watering, different kind of tools and tricks that you can use for watering. Increasing the humidity if we need to with misters or with the tray with the rock in it to kind of allow the moisture to come up through the plant. So increase the humidity will help if you've got uh, issues there. Watering your plants on a wet dry cycle, watching the tag, asking us questions, uh, finding out specific watering requirements for plants. Don't get on a schedule. Uh, plant food, feeding your plants, very important. Lots and lots of different solutions out there, liquid feeds, uh, different plants require different uh, fertilization, different plant food. Uh, typically, I recommend uh, feeding at least twice a year if you can, but a lot of plants, indoor plants, do fine with just once. And that's when I would typically use my granular fertilizer. I like a liquid feed every once in a while. It just kind of revives the plant and gets it rolling again. And Super Thrive is a great vitamin supplement. Awesome, awesome thing that you can use. Really, you'll love it when you use it. It's amazing what it does. Um, repotting our indoor plants, make sure to use a potting soil, never use a planting mix, never use compost, never use topsoil. Use a good professional indoor potting soil if you can find one, all purpose potting soil. Um, typically natural and organic potting soils stay wet longer because of the aloe wetting agent. Um, insect and disease issues, keep your eyes peeled. We talked about a lot of solutions. We have plenty of solutions. If you have an issue, come in and see us. Um, and that is really kind of your basic indoor care. I'm sure you've got lots of questions. I saw lots of questions stroll, strolling through, uh, uh, scrolling down through there. So I'm gonna get to your questions here in a minute. I do wanna do my top five easiest uh, indoor plants to grow. Um, so let's do those real quick because I got a lot. Now, first one I'm gonna start with is an honorable mention. Um, 
This one would have been my number six, but I had to bring it in just because I love it. ZZ plant is awesome. What an easy plant to grow. I love the structure and the habit. Super, super simple. Uh, very kind of modern style, very easy to grow. Uh, but ZZ plants are very, very low maintenance, wet, dry cycle, medium light, super, super easy plant to grow. ZZ plant number six, so I had to bring it in just to show you. Um, all right, so number five on my list is that bird's nest fern. Now, ferns in general are pretty easy, and the reason they are is because they don't require a lot of light. So a lot of us don't have a lot of natural light maybe coming in through our windows. Maybe you live in an apartment, and you've only got north side facing. Um, so ferns are a great option. They don't require a lot of light, and they're pretty easy on the moisture level. And the reason I brought the bird's nest in is because this one can actually go a little bit drier. So if you happen to, uh, to miss a couple days or a week, you're not gonna kill your bird's nest. Typically also, you're gonna see it kind of change color. They call it bird's nest fern because it kind of looks like a bird's nest in there. This one, I don't know if this one has a specific name. This one's called, um, I think it's just called bird's nest. But it's kind of got this different edge, this kind of like little split edge here, which is really kind of cool and unusual. Some bird's nest ferns are just a simple kind of branch like this. So just a straight up branch like this one. Doesn't have a lot on the end, but bird's nest ferns can take a little bit more of that dry period. So if you're not as good about watering, but you love ferns and you got a low light condition, this might be a good choice for you. Super, super easy one to grow. I uh, love this one. My daughter has one she absolutely loves um, and we haven't killed it yet. And she's doing a pretty good job about keeping an eye on it. If we water it really well, we can let it go pretty much almost almost six to, to or four to six weeks almost before we're watering again. We're not as good. We're not as heavy handed watering. We don't have a lot of, we have a lot more wet dry cycle plants than we do have uh, moist plants. Um, and so evenly moist soil is going to make this grow a little bit more aggressively. But if you forget, it's going to be okay. And this one's very, very tough and durable. So I love bird's nest ferns. That is my number five. All right. So number four is going to be aglaonemia. So aglaonemia, like I showed you earlier, I've got that one. This one is gorgeous. This one's called Aurora Siam. So aglaonemia, I love just that, that color, that foliage. Super, super easy plant to grow. Medium to low light, doesn't require a lot of light. Wet, dry cycle. They don't get too, too big. They're pretty slow growing, so you can keep them in containers for a long time, and they offer you color, which I love. Indoor plants, a lot of them are green and variegated, which I love too. But this one, you start to get some of those pink hues in there. So that one's awesome. I brought another one in that really shows you the color that you can get on it. Look at this guy. So this is called Wishes, Aglaonemia Wishes. Look at that color. I mean, it looks like a caladium to me. Absolutely amazing. Very, very easy plants to grow. Wet, dry cycle, medium to low light. You don't have to baby them too much. Kind of let them grow. Very, very simple. Every once in a while, you might get a little yellow leaf in there. You just can kind of pick it out. So we can just do that, get rid of that and this plant will thrive for years and years and years. You don't have to repot them very aggressively or, or very frequently, um, so they can grow in these pots for a long time, and you get color. I love color, and so this is a great option for you. So aglaonemia, um, and that other one that I showed you, Maria, a little bit more of that modern look. I leaf shined it, so they're really bright, um, but this is a great one too. Uh, looks awesome in just a pure white pot. Uh, very modern, kind of striking look. There's so many choices in the aglaonemias, and so that's why they're very, very easy to grow, and they all are very simple. Um, wet, dry cycle, medium to low light. Awesome, awesome plants. That would be my number, um, my number four. So my number three is going to be, where's my number three, is um, pothos. So pothos is an awesome one. So pothos is a really, really easy plant to grow. Um, pothos is a vining plant. So it's usually a great trailer. I love these up on bookcases or in hanging baskets. They'll trail over the side. This one right here that you can see next to me is really cool because we've got this totem pole in here. We've got this growing pole. This could be a piece of wood. It could be a lot of different things. You have to pin this to this to get this to grow like this. Um, it will kind of naturally root in a little bit, but once you get it pinned and get it growing, then it will naturally kind of grow up it. But they're great trailers. I love that look, that kind of apartment jungle look um, that you see kind of in the urban areas in New York where you've got lots of plants in a bookcase. These are awesome for that. Uh, they come in a, a neon, which is kind of that chartreuse green, pure green, and then golden pothos is one of the most popular. Very, very cool looking plant with this dappling of gold color in there. Um, and you can grow it lots of different ways. And you can kind of guide it around your home. These can grow, the vines on these can grow up to eight feet long. So you can put this up on the top of a bookcase and let it trail all the way down and through your bookcase. Really, really cool looking plant and very easy to grow. So again, medium, 
light. You can even go into low light. You can even go into a little bit of higher light. It's super, super versatile um, and really, really easy to grow. Uh, wet dry cycle again, super, super simple. So pothos is my number three easy go-to plant. Uh, my mom's got one. So mom, if you're watching, I know how easy it is because you're growing yours great. She's got long trailers coming down her bookcase. It's awesome. Um, so pothos, a great go-to if it's your first indoor plant and you're trying something out. Pothos are awesome. All right, number two on my list. We're on to number two is this rubber plant. So this is a ficus, a type of ficus. Um, it's called rubber plant because it looks artificial. <laughs> uh, it's got these great shiny leaves. I just love it because it's, it's a darker color. It's kind of different. So a lot of us have like lighter colored walls, um, grays or whites um, or beiges. Um, and this shows up great in there. And I just love this little bit of color that you see kind of poking in through there. So let's see if I can find where, there it is. Um, so right here, you can see that new leaf coming out. It's got that gorgeous new color to it. Some of the other new leaves, you can see how that kind of lighter, it almost looks like a magnolia leaf. Really, really pretty indoor plant. Super, super easy to grow. Um, medium to low light again, doesn't require a ton of light. Um, this is one of those indestructible plants. Uh, typically, everybody's very, very successful with these. If you're, if you're not being successful, it's probably because you're pampering it too much again. So make sure you got the right light condition, medium light, um, and then don't water it very often is what I recommend. It can actually take a little bit more moisture. So if, if you see it struggling, maybe you're not watering it enough, water it a little bit more. But if you're watering it too much, you probably can cut the water off. Um, uh, I definitely recommend probably watering it somewhere about every four to six weeks in a typical indoor condition because you're probably not gonna have a lot of light on it. So very, very easy plant to grow. Um, super, super versatile. Um, and I just love that color. I mean, just love all that. Look at that. The underside of that leaf with that new stem coming right there, just or that new leaf coming. So the leaves change colors. They come out in this kind of pink hue. Then they turn to this lighter kind of green, uh, this kind of really cool color. And then this almost deep burgundy with that awesome vein on the underside. Just a cool looking plant. Just one of my favorites. Super, super easy. If you got a go-to plant, this is one of them. My number two on my easiest indoor plants. Um, and then my number one is, of course, snake plants. Sansevieria snake plant, also called mother-in-law's tongue, uh, kind of a joke there, um, but very, very simple to grow. One of the easiest, and there's so many different kinds now, and you're seeing a lot of them. So you got more modern, striking looking ones like this with that very, very vertical. You've got some that kind of come out a little bit more. Um, you got this gold color, you got white variegation, you got one that's really thin. I should have grabbed that one, one of my favorites. Really thin, kind of looks like a blades of grass. Um, snake plants are super, super easy. Again, very versatile with the light conditions. You don't want it in bright direct light, but a bright room is okay, a medium, a low light, super, super easy to grow. Uh, not very aggressive growers. Um, they do kind of tend to pop out of these pots and that's usually when I'll recommend kind of replanting it is if you start to see a bulge coming out of this pot or you start to see something, then it's time to replant it. If it's really tight, uh, definitely a good time to replant it. Um, but they, they're very, very easy. Wet dry cycle for sure, water them really well, let them really dry out. Very, very easy plant to grow. My number one, if you have never grown an indoor, indoor plant and you want to, try a snake plant first. Very indestructible, like your mother-in-law's tongue. Um, so really, really good one. Uh, snake plant, Sansevieria, huge collection, lots and lots of different styles, and very easy to grow. So my number one for sure. Um, so I hope you all enjoyed this. That was kind of my basic one-on-one -on -one class. I know it went a little bit long, but I hope you got lots of good information. I'm going to answer all of your questions now um, and go through all those. Um, and if uh, you want to tune in on Friday, then Friday at 11 o'clock, I'm going to be talking about specific plants. We're going to go into a little bit more detail on succulents, orchids, bromeliads, uh, the, the, the huge assortment of, of all the different types of collectible plants and maybe rare plants that we can find. And I'll, and I'll bring a collection of what I have in stock right now. So you can kind of see what we've got right now and you can kind of see uh, the different types of plants we have in right now. Um, and so that'll be a fun one. We'll get a little bit more advanced um, and get a little bit more specific than we were today, which was kind of your basic 101. But I think we touched on some very, very important things. Um, and I hope that really helps. If you are taking off, um, then have a great day. Enjoy this nice sunny day. I can see the sun coming in through the window over here. Um, so it looks like a gorgeous day, cool temperatures, fall is here. Enjoy it. And I hope to see you Friday. If you're going to stick around, I'm going to answer all your questions now. Have a great day if you're taking off. All right. 
So some of my questions get knocked off. I'm going to see if I can figure out how to do this. I don't know that I can. So if I don't um, see your question, then that's because it's gotten kicked off my page uh, because I only scroll so far on my list. So if, um, if, I, if I don't see your question, then definitely ask it again and, um, and I'll try and answer it. Um, so Gloria said, are house plants uh, that are rooted in water okay to plant in soil? So there are some indoor plants that can grow very well in water. Um, and so uh, peace lilies kind of come to mind. They're ones that kind of back in the day we used to grow like above the fish tank and the fish would be underneath and it was that kind of whole cool life cycle of fertilizing with the fish poop and all that stuff. Anyways, um, but there are definitely some plants that can uh, grow in, 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 in almost a straight water condition. Um, I think of like a lot of times, I think of the, the insect or the, the carnivorous plants, the plants that eat insects, they grow in boggy conditions. Um, so yes, but if they grow in, in, in straight water, yes, you can grow them in a potting soil as well. Um, you're just gonna wanna keep it more evenly moist. So it's gonna be more in that firm palm world where you're gonna wanna water it um, a little bit more consistently to keep that soil evenly moist if you can. Judy said, thrive on neglect, my perfect house plant. <laughs> um, so Christine, uh, Chris, Kristen said, um, I would assume well water is fine though, right? Well water is great. Well water is very, very good. Watch out because sometimes well water will stain, especially concrete. You probably have that issue um, if you're using it to water your lawn or anything or your plants. Um, so just be careful with it. But other than that, water is per, uh, well water should be great. The plants will love that. Um, is bottled water, so Skylar said, is bottled water bad for plants? Bottled water is not bad for plants either. If you want to use it, that's fine, but you don't have to waste uh, the, the money on that. All you have to do is fill up your watering can and let it sit for a little while. Collect a little bit of rain wa water from time to time. Um, but bottled water is not going to hurt the plant for sure. It's just filtered water, so it's going to be better for the plant for sure, but you don't have to go to that length. So Skylar, I, I wouldn't recommend going and buying bottled water for your plants um, unless you want to. It's a nice treat for them every once in a while, right? Uh, Betsy says, how about uh, water from a running dehumidifier for watering plants? I don't see where there'd be a problem with that, Betsy. Um, I mean, that, that water is, is perfectly fine. So if you're using a dehumidifier in a room, uh, then water your plants with that water, not a problem. Just make sure it's clean. Um, I don't see where there'd be an issue. Maybe run it through a coffee filter in case there's dust or something built up in there. But really, other than that, it shouldn't be, shouldn't be a problem at all. Um, so Wendy said, I've done that for outdoor pots. Uh, replying to Betsy, so Wendy's used dehumidifier water, so it seems like it's going to be completely fine. I don't see where there'd be an issue at all. Um, Joyce said, try not to use tap water, chlorine, or fluoride water on delicate plants, even if it sits out a day if you can. So, so Joy, yeah, I mean, if you um, have ever experienced um, issues with your leaves um, by using tap water, then you might need to get some rainwater, um, or um, you, you might uh, try the, the bottled water technique. But typically, if you leave it sitting out for 24 to 48 hours, it really helps with a lot of that fluoride um, and, and bleach and chlorine. Um, so, let's see. Dottie said, I have one broken stem of a snake plant in half. I cut it off and place it in water. Will it grow roots? Um, so, snake plants, um, I've never been a propagation expert. I'll be very honest about that. I don't know a lot about propagation. But snake plants are pretty easy to root, I believe. Uh, it's all about timing typically, so probably spring is, is going to be a better time to try it. Um, I probably wouldn't try it in straight water. I would probably plant it right into a soil. What I would do is get a rooting hormone, um, and when you make that cut, so I would cut it again because it's probably healed over. You can see on this leaf right here, I don't know if you can see that, but there's kind of like a browning where when you've cut it, it's kind of formed a scab to heal itself. Um, so that's going to be harder to root, but if you make a fresh cut again, you just kind of cut it off a little bit. You, you get that open wound going again. Um, dip it in some rooting hormone, put it in pine soil. That's what I would say do with a snake plant. Seems to make sense to me. Um, some plants will root a little bit better into straight water, but into soil, um, it was, it's probably better for a snake plant that can take a little bit of that drier condition and doesn't probably love sitting in moisture. Kind of similar to a succulent. Succulent, you can take the leaf off, lay it on top of soil, and then it'll root down into that. Um, and we'll get into a little bit more specifics on that. I've just never been a propagation expert for sure. Um, all right, so Melissa said, does the organic green leaf have a bad smell if using for indoor? It does not. Um, so I'll open it right now and just make sure, but it, it's uh, made, 
No, it just smells like an organic fertilizer. It's got kind of an earthy fragrance to it. Um, it's made from, let's see, turkey litter, feather meal, and sulfate of potash. So, um, so completely organic, um, completely safe. Um, because it's got turkey litter and feather meal, it just might get your dog or cat kind of excited and get it, it kind of messing around in there. Um, what you can also do is kind of, you know, brush up the top of that soil a little bit. Um, you know, kind of, kind of rough it up just a little bit lightly, not to hurt your root system. Put your uh, fertilizer in there and then just kind of lay it back down in there and water it in real well. Shouldn't have an issue. If you find that you are experiencing some issue with your indoor animals with it, um, then uh, you might try the uh, traditional green leaf. They typically don't get anywhere near that. Um, and it's not uh, really, it's not going to be bad or anything. And it lasts a little bit longer too. Um, so let's see. Gloria said, can I cut off my too tall corn plant and root and soil as a new shorter plant? Uh, Gloria, that's a great question. And as you probably already know, um, I don't know that I have the answer to that. Corn plants are pretty easy plants to grow as well. Um, I can't imagine that it would be hard to root that. I'm just not a propagation expert. Gloria, what I would recommend is if you're local, um, come into the Independence location and talk to Sarah, or I'll go talk to her and try and answer your question here uh, when, when, when I sign off. Uh, but Gloria, that's a great question. I just don't, I, for some reason, that's just never been kind of my forte. I got lots of, or I should say, I always have a little bit of knowledge about a lot of things uh, when it comes to gardening. But propagation has just never been one of those. I know the technique of air layering and, and uh, grafting and rooting and all those different things. I've got a little, very little bit of knowledge. But when we get to a specific plant, it gets a little bit more challenging. So I'll see if I can find out the answer for you and get back to you if I can. Um, so let's see. Melissa said, love Super Thrive uh, for when I bring my plants back inside after they spend a summer outside. Yep, Melissa, Super Thrive is awesome. And now they got this new foliar spray, which is great. Uh, Wendy said, I got special fertilizer for an African violet, but it is really better than general fertilizers. But is it really better than a general fertilizer? So Wendy, um, you can use a general fertilizer. African violets are a little bit more specific. Orchids are a little bit more specific. And you can get specific fertilizers for these different types of plants. I mean, they make a indoor a cactus and succulent, a citrus, a um, African violet, and an orchid. So you've got all these different ones to choose from. I don't know that there's any specific, specific difference. I'm sure an African violet, um, and I didn't grab one to check, but uh, most African violet uh, uh, plant foods are going to have usually a little bit of a higher middle number of phosphorus, which is going to help promote more blooms because that's what you're getting out of an African violet. I know our orchid fertilizers have a, a traditional orchid fertilizer, which is very basic. Um, and then it's got a bloom booster, which is going to help kind of push some blooms on it as we get to that time frame. Um, so I'll talk about that a little bit more on Friday, and maybe I'll bring in some more specific fertilizers um, to kind of show you all the differences on that. Uh, but I would not say it's better. Um, it's more specific, not better. Um, general fertilizers would be perfectly fine. Um, African violets uh, probably are going to be a little bit more accustomed to a liquid feed because um, that's what you're probably more used to. Um, but uh, a granular fertilizer is great for your foliage plants um, and, and kind of that basic general fertilizer that you can use on everything. Uh, do you fertilize plants in the winter months? So typically not, Gloria. So Gloria, um, in the winter, I typically try not to water as much. Um, you know, you're not going to water it as frequently and you're not going to get a lot of growth. And a fertilizer, a plant food typically, is going to kind of urge a plant to put on some new growth in a time frame that maybe it doesn't want to. Now, if you keep a very nice warm area, maybe you've got a sunroom that stays nice and warm, doesn't get too cool at night. I know my sunroom gets pretty chilly at night during the winter um, and can warm up pretty warm during the day. Um, so that's a fairly sharp fluctuation in temperature. It's hard to kind of maintain that. And I don't typically get a lot of growth out of my plants in my sunroom. Um, just because it does get kind of cooler at night. It doesn't have great insulation. There's a lot of windows. Um, but you would get more sunlight. Now, if you've got a warm area that gets a great amount of light during the day, you might get more growth during the winter, and then a, a plant food's not going to be too bad for it. Um, but, uh, but typically, I, I usually recommend fertilizing in the, in the spring, and then again, late summer, mid to late summer, to kind of give it a little bit of boost into the fall season. And then it's kind of gone and out of its way um, as we get into the winter months. So we're not forcing a plant to grow when it maybe doesn't want to. Um, Wendy said, I heard years ago to use leaf shine products only on the top side of leaves because the product would clog the, sto the stomata on the undersides of the leaves, which would be bad. So yes, typically um, what I will tell people with, um, uh, with where did my leaf shine go? With leaf shine is be careful. It's not something that I would use a ton of. Um, I, I, don't, I don't recommend using it every week or every month. 
Um, just use it if you want to use it. It's a great way of cleaning, especially if you've got a plant that maybe sits like on a top shelf and gets a lot of dust um, and, and you're just going to kind of clean it up or freshen it up real quick. Um, I don't recommend using it a whole lot, um, but it does help kind of shine up your leaves. It really shows them off. I might do mine every, I don't know, maybe twice a year. Um, I'll go through with a little leaf shine just to, to spruce them up a little bit and get them shiny and get them cleaned off a little bit. But rain, water, shower, uh, hand wiping are all great options. With a mister helping, all of those are great options. Leaf shine is just is a, is a quick kind of thing if you want to brighten them up. Maybe they look a little dull even after wiping them off. They look a little bit dull and you want to spruce them up, especially if you've got like friends and company coming over and you want to spruce up your plants. Leaf shine is a great option. Try not to, I definitely would agree. I haven't read that before, Wendy, um, but I would say don't put it on the undersides of the leaves. It's more for the top side of the leaves uh, for sure. Um, and, and I know the biggest thing is keep it 12 to 18 inches away so you're not right up on the plant. It's very cold when this comes out and you don't want to blast all that cold air on it uh, or get it too close. You can damage your leaves for sure. So be careful with it for sure. Read your directions on any of your solutions. Anything you're thinking about putting on a plant, plant food, uh, uh, insecticides, fungicides, leaf shine, always read the label. There's great information in there uh, and it'll help kind of uh, uh, make any mistakes if, if, if we do have any. Um, let's see, Heidi says, it's said to go one size, pot size up transplant. I like to do a combination planting. What recommendations can you give for their best survival rate? Um, so great, great question, Heidi. I believe I understand. Um, and then she said, need recommendation on the best way to transplant roots rooted into water, uh, in water into soil. So Heidi, you've got plants maybe growing in water and you want to do them into soil. That's perfectly fine, perfectly easy. Uh, it's all about choosing the right pot size for those. Um, I think it's probably the most important thing. So, uh, you know, kind of pulling out that, that plant or maybe measuring it inside the water uh, if you want to go into um, a soil. We also can do a root prune, which is not a horrible thing to do to kind of get those roots. Um, just like pruning a plant might bush it out, which I didn't talk about pruning a lot. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more on Friday. But every time you prune a plant, it'll get bushier and fuller on the inside. So if I take this stem and I prune it back, in fact, you can see, look, that one's been pruned back right there and you've got all these new leaves shooting out and you'll get new growth and a burst of new growth. Same thing happens with roots. That's what they do with bonsai plants. They prune the roots and you get this burst of growth coming off of it. Um, it's completely natural. Um, so if we need to kind of prune that root system down a little bit, Heidi, to get into a, to, to, to a container that we need to get into, we can do that. We might give it a little bit of super thrive because it's gonna be a bit of a shock going from water into soil, um, but it should be perfectly uh, easy to do. Just get a nice all-purpose potting soil, make sure you get it around that root system, kind of play with it. It all depends on what the root system looks like when you take it out of the water as to how you might accomplish that. Uh, but what you probably are gonna do is Put a little bit of soil probably in somewhat of a pyramid. So you're probably going to put in a little bit of a pyramid pile. Put your root system on top of that and then fill around that. And then what you want to do is just make sure you don't bury it too deep is probably the biggest recommendation I can give you there. Now, on your other question, um, when you said, I like to do combination planting, what recommendations can you give the best survival rate? Combination plantings are very similar. We just don't want too much soil. Um, so if we're going to put three of these size plants, let's say I don't really have a combination here, maybe I can talk about that Friday too, is um, if I've got three of these six inch planters, then that's probably gonna be in a 14, maybe a 16 inch planter. Um, so what you're measuring there is, let's say you're gonna put three in a pot. So I've got you know two six inch planters. I wanna give them about eight inches of space. So that's 16 inches width is probably pretty much what I'm gonna need. So kind of just do a little bit of math. Also ask us questions, we can help you figure it out. Um, but combination planters are great indoors. You know, mixing all of your indoor plants into one area. Just make sure they, they have the same light requirements. I like to try and get them in the sim similar, similar um, uh, watering requirements if I can. So I'm not watering one plant a little bit more than all the other plants. I like to get the watering the same. The, the, make sure I know what the size is. Make sure if I've got a trailing one, a bushier one, a tall one. Um, I always like my combinations to have those three elements um, of that spiller, thriller, and filler. Um, and then if they've got all the same light requirements. Other than that, just don't put it in a humongous pot. If it's too big of a pot, you gotta have that pot, go get some more plants, put some more plants in there to eat up some of that soil um, uh, issue that you might have. Um, Skyler said, do you spray that on the soil or directly onto the plant? I believe you're probably talking about 
uh, my favorite little indoor outdoor spray. Yes, you can spray this right on the soil. You can actually take it out of the pot, out of the plastic pot and spray it around on the root ball, spray it on the leaves, spray it kind of everywhere. It is aerosol, so similar to the um, leaf shine. Just make sure you're kind of doing it from a distance and just kind of getting in there. It'll settle on the plant, settle on the root system, and it kills a lot of different parts, of a, a lot of different insects. So that, that's a really good one. Um, is triple action organic? So great question. Um, yes and no. <laughs> so triple action concentrate, which I didn't bring in here, is organic. It's actually listed, Omri listed organic. Uh, this one is not listed organic because it's got this um, pipe, I, I'm gonna butcher this word, I've never been good at pronouncing chemical names, uh, but it's not a chemical, it's butoxide. Uh, basically what it is is, is a surfactant um, that is put in here to help it stick to the leaves and it's a traditional made surfactant. So it's not an organic surfactant. So that causes this one to not be um, organic, but the concentrate is. So if you wanna be completely kind of, Omri listed, then um, I would go with the, the uh, concentrate because that one is certified Omri listed organic. This one just isn't because it has that one thing in there that really just kind of helps it stick to the leaves of the plant and make it apply a little bit easier. So, I, you know, so no, this is not completely organic, but the concentrate is. And we've got organic solutions too. If you want to be, uh, if you want to ready to use that is organic, the neem oil and the spinosad soap are great. Deanna said, do they actually grow a lot better inside? Keep them by a sunny window. I water about once a week. So she was replying to Deanna. Um, so Judy said, learn so much. My favorite quote, in case I have people coming over on a Saturday night, I can get my plants looking nice and shiny. Um, good, I'm glad. Um, Heidi said, I always do my plants repotting during the winter and was told not to fertilize them. Is this true? I always recommend, I mean, winter is not a bad time to do it. Uh, but what I will say is spring is a little bit better. I mean, just because you're going to get a little bit more growth, you're going to go into a large, so in the winter, like I said, they're not going to grow as actively. So by planting them, by, by transplanting them then or repotting them, then, it's not going to cause as much, I guess, shock. So I would say that's probably true for sure. Um, but the problem is, is because they're not active, I got a mosquito in here. Um, because they're not actively growing, um, sorry, because they're not actively growing, then it's not going to be able to use a lot of that moisture that you just added with all this extra potting soil. Um, and hopefully you're not grading up as big, which I think will help as well. Um, but so that's why I tend to say more spring. And what I mean by spring is like March, April. So we're just coming out of winter. Um, and, and so it's a little bit of a better time to, in my eyes, to repot then rather than going into winter or during winter. Um, so, and then was told not to fertilize. Is this true? Yes, for sure. If you're doing it in the winter, I don't recommend fertilizing in the winter. It's gone through one issue of the transplant shock repotting from one pot to another pot. It's moved its main home. Um, you've disturbed its root system a little bit. It's completely natural. It's going to be fine. It's going to come out of it. But by putting a plant food in it, again, we're encouraging a plant to grow. And in that time frame, it won't want to. In the spring, you can repot. You can give it a, a week or two to kind of get acclimated. And then we can feed right after that. Ebony said, name of the aerosol spray again. So probably not the leaf shine. That's one aerosol. That's pretty easy leaf shine. Probably the indoor outdoor made by Fertilome. Indoor outdoor, all purpose, multi-purpose insect spray. Just a really good one. Really, really easy um, one to use around the home. So most potting soil already has fertilizer mixed in it. No need to fertilize with new potting mix. I will agree. Um, so Heidi, I think you were replying to Heidi. I use potting mix that already has fertilizer in it. How long does the fertilizer last before I need to add some? So look on the bag of potting soil that you're using. Hopefully it's, it's our McDonald potting soil. Um, so if you do use our McDonald all-purpose potting soil, you're going to see the fertilizer is extremely light. Um, and that is very, very just kind of get the plant kind of going a little bit. Um, and, and so just gives a little bit in there, but it's very, very light, like 0.1, I believe. Uh, so very, very small amounts of, of fertilizer in there. If you're using miracle Grow, it might be a little bit stronger. Uh, and a lot of the bags say feed up to three months. Um, ours is not going to feed very long. It's not a lot of fertilizer in there. It's not a lot of plant food in our uh, all-purpose or natural organic potting soil. It is just naturally in there a little bit. Um, so, but I would say it's maybe going to last two or three weeks at the most, and it's not really enough that you can't put more uh, plant food on top of it if you want to. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about that. Uh, 
Um, Gretchen said, if we want to bring in a plant for your evaluation, who do we ask for or where do we go? So Gretchen, if you bring in your plant, just say, I, I need to talk to somebody in the house plant department um, and you'll kind of head back to our greenhouse here at Independence or same at our Great Neck location, head to the back um, into our house plant department and we'll get a house plant expert to look at it. Um, there's some great ones here at Independence um, and as well as Great Neck, people that know a lot about plants. But seeing is, it really helps us understand um, uh, what kind of what kind of issue you might be experiencing. So pictures help, but bringing in the real life thing if you can does really help us and we might be able to even help you. For a small charge we might be able to repot it or we might find an issue that we can treat right there right then and there. So uh, definitely definitely helps if you want to bring it in. Uh, let's see. Heidi said, my girlfriend's snake plant bloomed this summer. Talk about being surprised. Yep, they do have kind of a cool little bloom that kind of comes shooting out on the stalk. It's really kind of different and unusual. Um, and that means it's happy. That means it's very, very happy, uh, typically. Um, all right, everybody's saying thank you. I'm sure I missed some questions at the beginning, so I'll go back and try and answer those unless you re-ask uh, them. Um, So Anne said, I have a lamb's ear indoors. Most of it is it's shriveled and dead looking. However, there is one. Um, so Anne, it might be struggling a little bit. Um, I, lamb's ear might grow inside. I don't know. Um, but like I said, Mother Nature didn't create indoor plants. We kind of over the time have kind of acclimated and figured out things. I know lamb's ear is a perennial and it goes dormant. So it might be trying to go into a dormancy time frame. Um, and, and that's part of the natural life cycle of a lot of plants is they want to go into a dormant period. They want to kind of take a rest and take their winter nap and then come out of it in the spring. So that might be the issue there is that it's not the easiest plant to grow inside. I'm not saying that it can't be done. Um, I just don't know. Um, and so, uh, so if, if it doesn't look like it's real happy, you might consider taking your lamb's ear outside and growing it um, outdoors if you can. Carol said, off subject, do you carry hot pepper spray? Yes, I do. Hot pepper wax spray um, is a great way to ward off uh, squirrels, rabbits, deer, anything from eating your plants outside. Um, so that I definitely do carry. Um, all right, so Christina said, I have a poinsettia, which I am so proud I nursed back to health. It is possible to get it bloom before December. Who makes that indoor outdoor spray? Fertilome, my orchid is in transition. Any tips with sun and fertilizing to get it to bounce back? Um, so I, by transition um, on, on your orchid, I'm assuming saying that it's gone from not blooming and you wanna get it back to blooming again. Um, and so, so orchids, we're gonna talk a little bit more detail on about uh, on, on Friday, uh, but orchids are kind of similar. They, they like um, to go through a little bit of a seasonal change in temperature. Uh, which it naturally will go through. Um, and so that kind of will help. It does take some time. It's not, you can't, it's typically not like you get a bloom and then when it fades off, you get another bloom set right after it. They don't continuously bloom. They'll take somewhere, depending on the type of orchid, and there's a lot of them, um, six to eight months maybe before you get another bloom set. Um, so it might just be a little bit more time. And we'll talk about, I'll bring in those plant foods. So Christina, if you can check back in on Friday, I'll talk a lot about orchids in that one. Uh, which maybe will help uh, with your orchid issue. Um, and then you talked about poinsettias. Poinsettias are a tricky one. So poinsettias, um, uh, there, there's a whole list of how you've got to get those to bloom. And really the blooms are those little yellow things inside the inside of the poinsettia. The, the bracts are the new leaves and they will emerge red with a certain amount of daylight in a day. And, I, and I, I, this is probably one of those things I know a little bit about, but I don't know much about. Um, and so I know that there's a length of time. And so a lot of people that try and get a poinsettia to grow for a year and then get it to, to, to the bracts to color up and for the December time frame for Christmas um, is a little bit trickier to do. Um, I would do a little bit of research on the internet um, and, and see if, if there's some sort of chart or schedule that you can get on. A lot of people take it and put it in a closet for a certain amount of time frame. It needs a certain amount of darkness for every night, basically. So it needs a little bit, it needs a, a certain amount of daylight, it needs a certain amount of darkness. Um, and so I, I just remember when we used to grow them in our Hampton location, um, is, is we were told not to go back into the production greenhouse at night and turn the lights on um, at a certain time. 
uh, because the, the bracts were coloring. And so we had, to, we had to keep it dark for a certain amount of period. I just don't remember exactly how many hours that was. So Christina, if you do a little bit of research, I bet you can find out. Um, if you can't, let me know. I'll do a little bit of research. I'll find out. Um, I can still probably talk to our poinsettia grower from back in the day. I've got her uh, phone number and see if she's got maybe some sort of an idea of chart uh, or idea on time frame of when you want to start. But I would guess you probably would start that pretty soon. We used to get our poinsettias in around September, um, so October. So, so that would be probably when I would start looking at trying to figure out that, that amount of darkness that you need to get to get those bracts to color to red. So Janelle said, does cayenne pepper on the top of soil stop gnats and fruit flies as well? Um, I've never heard that one, cayenne pepper. Um, I, typically with home remedies, um, I, I tend to find that home remedies might, might not work. But I don't typically recommend them or always use them. Um, there are lots of different people that say, you know, you can use dish soap and mix it with water. Um, I like to use an insecticidal soap because I know it's designed for plants. I don't have to think about it. I don't have to worry about it. Um, so cayenne pepper, I can't imagine it's going to do anything bad for the soil. I can't imagine that would happen at all. Um, but I don't know if it works on, on, on fungus, gnats, or fruit flies. Uh, I'm not sure. Corey, thank you. Thank you for the nice comment. So Heidi said, uh, that happened with my snake plant also. I just stuck it in dirt about a month ago and it's doing fine. The piece I put in water and the east window turned yellow. It's now sitting in dirt and hasn't died nor gotten healthy. Uh, so Heidi, you might have answered our, our question there, which is, um, you know, snake plants probably going to do a little bit better for propagation purposes uh, uh, in some soil. Um, so what is the best way to get rid of mealy bugs? Thank you. Uh, so mealy bugs, again, you got a couple different solutions. Um, the indoor outdoor fertile worm spray is a great one because mealy bugs can get into all those different little nooks and crannies. Really, really good traditional method. Um, and then if you were going to go with uh, 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 organic method, then the spinosad soap, the natural gar guard. This is omri listed, completely safe. Usually it's going to be safe for pretty much any plant. So the insecticidal soap with spinosad in there is an awesome, awesome thing. Insecticidal soaps are great. This one's just a little bit better because it's got an organic insecticide, which is spinosad. So really, really good option there for you. Uh, and that works great on mealybug too. Uh, any kind of organic solution, I would typically will say, just be wary that you might have to make multiple treatments. And really that goes with any kind of fungicide or insecticide is you might have to make multiple treatments. It just might take a couple tries to really get it out of there. Um, so Gloria, so Heidi's talking to Gloria, I've been told you can cut and replant. It does, however, take a long time to see new growth recommended using root tone. It's great. Um, so yeah, that, that's a rooting hormone, I believe. Uh, root tone is one. We carry a rooting powder made by Fertilome, uh, which are all basically the same. You make that cut, you dip it in a little bit of water, you dip it in a little bit of root tone or rooting hormone, and you put it in soil and that'll help kind of generate roots. So Valerie said, I heard that cleaning the leaves with milk shines them up. Is this okay? I can't, again, imagine that that's bad. Um, I mean, calcium is good for plants. Um, again, home remedies, I just don't know a lot about. Um, I would probably just rather use a, a, a damp uh, dish towel just because you know water is going to be safe on it for sure. Um, so Valerie, I'm not sure. I've never heard that. Um, I'm sure there's lots of home remedies, out, home remedies out there. I would be concerned about a film kind of building up over time would be my only concern with maybe that home remedy um, of something of that milk kind of or that you know, milk can go sour and, and then you've got a smell. So I don't know. I, I guess for me, I like to stick to the basics and the simples and the things that I know work. Um, and that's, of course, what I sell. So that's what I know. Um, home remedies, uh, I'm not saying that they don't work, but I don't typically um, uh, know a lot about them. Uh, Gloria said, overwintering amaryllis in pots on cover um, in pots on covered right now. So uh, I, I'm assuming you see overwintering amaryllis in um, uh, question mark in pots on a covered porch maybe right now. Um, so uh, amaryllis, um, if you buy an amaryllis here, well, which we don't have yet, but we'll have them in soon. They're prepared. What prepared means is they've gone through a cool period. Amaryllis would typically bloom in the spring. So if you've got one outside, it's going to complete, get, be completely fine. Leave it out all winter. In the spring, it should put new leaves out and bloom in the spring. If you want to force it to bloom in the winter, around Christmas time frame, that's a little bit trickier. We need to get into a cool place for an extended amount of time, like two to three months. 
So typically what I will tell people is buy prepared amaryllises. They have been prepared and they've been designed to grow in, they've been forced to be tricked, I guess you could say, because they've been through a winter time frame for two to three months. And then it warms up when you bring them inside and you plant them inside and then you get the blooms and the new growth. Um, with something for us to kind of do that, you would have to think about putting it in the refrigerator, which I don't, again, know a lot about. Um, trying to get it in, into a cool state for two to three months and then bring it back inside. But if you want to leave it outside, Gloria, it'll be perfectly fine. You can plant it in the ground. You can leave it in the pot. It'll grow in the spring and bloom for you in the spring. A lot of people grow amaryllis in the garden uh, um, after they've planted them inside. Uh, Wandering Drew, is this an easy plant to take care of? Yes. Very, very easy plant. A lot of people use it in hanging baskets again. Good trailing plant. Very, very easy. Uh, medium to high light, or sorry, medium to low light, um, and a wet dry cycle. Kind of get, get that succulent kind of feel, um, but a very, very easy one um, to, to, to grow. Um, so what, what's best to do for our houseplants in the fall? So houseplants in the fall, um, as you go into, so if you haven't put a plant food on them yet uh, for a second time this year, if you've had them for a while, now's an okay time to do that. Um, we're still getting good bright light. It's not too cool in our house, so you can get that second feed in. Clean the leaves. Make sure you're on the white watering recommendations. As the outside temperature is cool, so will your house. Um, and growing will, will, will drop a little bit. So uh, watering should become a little bit less typically. Um, other than that, you're really kind of in, in, the, in the gravy zone. You're kind of in that, in that time frame where you don't have to do a lot. Um, so check for insects if you're bringing them from outside inside. Uh, just kind of keep an eye on them. Uh, feed them a little bit if you can. If, if there's nothing much, much else that you want to do, Super Thrive is a good option. Um, and then just kind of watch your watering. You should be slacking off on your watering a little bit. Um, so, so that's pro pretty much about it for your fall. Now, uh, what you might want to do is add to your collection. Great time to come in and get some, some new houseplants. Um, that's why we're talking about it this week. Carol said, see you this afternoon. See you then. Gloria said, great. Everybody's saying thank you. Um, Deanna said, would like tips on separating peace lilies. Love this informational. Excellent. Great. So Deanna, uh, was separating any type of plant. It's pretty simple, and I guess the best way to describe it is, let's see, this is a pretty easy one that you can see. So in here, you can see I've got one, two, I've got three different plants. Now these were probably grown from small plugs, so what I would do is if I'm gonna separate these, um, is I would take it out, I would gently press my thumbs into the side here, and basically gently kind of separate those roots. I'm trying not to tear the root system up too bad, very, very simple process. With peace lilies, you might see a lot of leaves coming out of the, of the, of the, of the soil level. Um, maybe more like this pothos here. So in the pothos, if you can see, let's see if I can show this. So look, I've got lots of different little plants uh, poking up out of the soil. So here, again, just being gentle is probably the most important thing. You're gonna hurt the root system. It's okay, just try not to damage it too much. I wouldn't take a shovel and chop through it. I would try and do it with your hands as much as you possibly can to gently pull that apart as much as you can. You might soak it in moist. Uh, you might make sure you get it really nice and wet before you do it. That does tend to help you break it apart a little bit easier. Um, and just don't use a knife to cut it, basically, unless it's a super, super tough uh, root system, which you might find if it's an older peace lily. So um, just be careful with it. And then use a um, uh, something like a Super Thrive uh, after you've done that to just kind of take that shock off. Um, you might even use like a, a root stimulator to help regenerate roots, but I wouldn't go straight onto it with a plant food yet. Uh, use something with a higher phosphorus or that Super Thrive, which will take some of the shock off of, of, its, new, um, of its new root system that it's going to generate. Um, so hopefully that helps you, Deanna. Um, Heidi said, thank you. I know, Heidi, you had lots of questions, and I think you got a lot of answers. I was scrolling through them. I'll go back and read uh, just to make sure you got all of them answered. Um, All right, and then everybody said thanks. So thanks for addressing my full question. All right, I think I've got to everybody. Everybody have a great day. Uh, we've only got about 20 people left, so uh, I guess you stuck around for all my, my answers. Um, so have a great day. Hopefully you'll tune in on Friday where we'll get a little bit more specific and I'll bring in a huge assortment of plants um, to talk about all the different types of plants that you can grow uh, and get a little bit more specific on some of our favorites um, and some of those trendy, popular, hard to find, uh, different types of groups you know, bromeliads, orchids, succulents, 
uh, philodendrons. There's so many, so many different choices. The fiddle leaf figs. How do we grow all of these plants that we want that might be a little bit harder than my top five easiest, uh, but uh, can be done very easily. So we'll talk about that. I uh, hope you have a great couple days. I'll see you on Friday if you tune in. Uh, if not, have a great weekend, and we hope to see you soon. Have a great day, everybody. Bye.